Hearing will come to order. Uh, welcome, uh, Director Ray. Appreciate you coming over. 
We're going to try to get you out of here by 1 o'clock. I know you got an agency to run in a dangerous world out there. We'll do, I think, seven-minute rounds. Yes. And uh, if there's any cleanup, we'll, we'll try to accommodate. Very briefly, uh, this oversight hearing uh, comes at an important time. Even though there's no evidence that the Russians changed the tally of the 2016 election, I think they exceeded their wildest expectations in terms of interfering with the 2016 election. I think all of us are very interested in what we can do to make sure this doesn't happen again in 2020. I'm very interested in what China is doing. Uh, the Section 2015 authorities are about to expire. I want to hear from the director as to what that means to the country. We have a FISA warrant investigation that will be coming here soon. We've got a problem with media leaks at the FBI. Having said all that, uh, it's been a difficult time for the FBI. But let's not let a few bad actors taint a great organization. Before we start, I want to just tell you and all those who work under your charge that we appreciate what they do. Uh, without their service day in and day out, this country would be a much dangerous place to live in. And um, we'll do everything we can to get this budget deal through because sequestration would be a slap in their face. Senator Feinstein. Thanks very much. Uh Mr. Chairman, and let me reiterate welcome. It's great to see you. Slightly more gray than we saw you last time, but I guess there's good reason for that in any event. Welcome. Um, it's been nearly two years since you were confirmed to run the FBI, and so we have a lot of important topics to cover. Uh, I think during this time, democracy and the rule of law have come under attack. Foreign governments have interfered in the United States elections and continue to conduct influence campaigns that are designed to divide Americans along racial, religious, and political lines. The president has declared that he has an absolute right to control the Justice Department, that the executive branch is immune from congressional oversight, and that Americans who disagree with him can go back to where they came from. Over the past two years, the president has attacked the FBI, describing the bureau in tweets as corrupt and full of dirty cops. He has also suggested that the FBI is part of a deep state and politically biased against him. It's my view that these claims are false and that they're harmful. They undermine public confidence in the FBI's ability to enforce the law impartially, which you do. Internal employee surveys show that while morale was high in 2016 under former Director Comey, it has declined in 2017 after the president fired the director and began publicly attacking the bureau. While the president has claimed that the FBI's investigation of his campaign's possible coordination with Russia was started illegally, the Mueller report confirms that there was a legitimate and lawful reason to open the investigation. The Mueller report explains that the FBI started investigating possible coordination between the Trump campaign and Russia in response to information provided by a foreign government shortly after WikiLeaks started releasing documents stolen by Russia from the DNC. The Mueller report further explains that in late July 2016, shortly after WikiLeaks first started releasing information stolen by Russia from DNC computers, Australia told the FBI that months earlier, Trump campaign advisor George Papadopoulos had told Australia's top diplomat in Britain that Russia had dirt on Hillary Clinton in the form of thousands of emails, and that Russia had indicated it could help the Trump campaign by releasing those stolen emails to damage candidate Clinton. In fact, the Mueller report concluded the Trump campaign welcomed, encouraged, and expected to benefit electorally from Russia's efforts. We should be grateful for the work that law enforcement does to stop foreign governments from interfering in United States elections. This is especially true now with another presidential election ahead. We know that Russia's efforts are ongoing 
and that other foreign powers will not hesitate to exploit opportunities to interfere in our elections and democracy. You have warned us, Director Ray, that Russia is, quote, adapting and upping their game, end quote, and have described Russia's efforts to meddle in the 2018 midterm elections as a, quote, dress rehearsal for the big show in 2020, end quote. You have also stated that, quote, enormous strides, end quote, have been made since 2016 to protect our elections. So I ask you to give us a frank assessment today of how prepared we are, in particular at state and local level, to identify and address foreign interference in the 2020 election. And moreover, what more needs to be done? Threats to the nation from terrorists, from criminals, and from foreign governments seeking to steal our secrets and undermine our elections and democracy, I believe, are very real. The 37,000 men and women of the FBI are on the front lines every day addressing these threats and helping Americans be safe. The FBI is not a corrupt institution or the deep state. It is not acting against the president for political purposes. So we need to come together in a bipartisan fashion to support you and this institution, even as we conduct important oversight. I am very proud to be supportive of your organization and its mission. I thank you for your leadership. I know it's tough, and we look forward to hearing your testimony. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Before I turn it over to the director, just a, a quick comment on uh, Senator Feinstein's uh, opening statement. The committee will be looking at the counterintelligence investigation of the Trump campaign. We will call Papadopoulos, and we'll find out what happened. We'll wait on Mr. Horowitz to do his report about the FISA warrant abuse, but we'll take a deep dive into the 2016 surveillance by the FBI and other organizations of campaigns, make sure that <clears throat> we know what we're doing and there are protocols in place going forward uh, to ensure that we don't play politics with the law. Uh, Mr. Ray. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, Frank Member Feinstein, members of the committee for the- Wait a minute, I need to swear to you, and I apologize. All right. <laughs> Right hand, please. You solemnly swear the testimony you're about to give is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but truth, so if you got it. Thank you. Sorry about that. So, thank you, Mr. Chairman, Ranking Member Feinstein, members of the committee, for the chance to appear before you today. I had originally intended to start with a few comments from my statement for the record, which talks about some of the extraordinary work being done by the men and women of the FBI and some of the threats we face. But I want to do something a little different and talk about an issue that's particularly near and dear to me and that I think, frankly, doesn't get the attention it deserves uh, before I turn to the many important questions of the committee. Uh, as you say, Senator Feinstein, I've been in the job just under two years, and one of the toughest things about this job is the loss of a law enforcement officer. And certainly at the FBI, we've experienced our share of loss, but the success of the FBI also depends greatly on the support of our dedicated state and local law enforcement partners who patrol our neighborhoods, protect our streets all across America. And I see that much more clearly now after having visited all 56 of the FBI's field offices and having spoken directly with local law enforcement heads from every one of your states. Our state and local partners serve on the FBI's Joint Terrorism Task Forces all across the country. They're force multipliers in our fight against drug trafficking, in taking down gangs, in saving kids who've been kidnapped, and in countless other efforts that help keep Americans safe. They also give the FBI a much clearer understanding of the threats across the different communities in your states and ideas about how we can better combat them together. Every time I attend an FBI graduation for new agents or new analysts at Quantico, a significant number of those graduates are former state 
and local officers. And I have the privilege of shaking their hands, presenting them with their credentials and welcoming them to the FBI family. So a line of duty death is personal to the FBI and it's personal to me as director. And I have a feeling it's personal to a number of you. Since I became director shortly thereafter, I asked my team to let me know every time an officer is shot and killed in the line of duty in this country. And every time it happens, I ask for a picture of the officer and I read about his or her family and about how long they served. And then I pick up the phone and I call the chief or the sheriff or the commissioner and on behalf of the entire FBI, I extend my support and our condolences. And I will tell you, I've made an awful lot of those calls to heartbroken police departments, way, way too many. Just, just last month, for example, I was overseas meeting with foreign counterparts and I found myself making five of those calls in nine days back to the United States. That's five lost protectors of communities, five grieving families and colleagues, all in a matter of days. One of the calls I made uh, was to the Sacramento Police Department, uh, the home of Senator Feinstein of you and, of course, Senator Harris. Just a few weeks ago on June 19th, Officer Tara O'Sullivan was killed while responding to a domestic disturbance. She was 26 years old, and she'd only been on the job for about six months. Another call I made, literally, only about a day later, was to the home state of Senator Cornyn and Senator Cruz. Corporal Jose Esperiqueta from the Mission Police Department was killed while trying to catch a guy who had threatened his family with a gun and then fled on foot. Corporal Esperiqueta was 44 years old and had a wife and two kids. So these calls never get any easier. In just under two years as director, I've already had to make condolence calls like that to more than half of the states represented on this committee and I've had to speak to some chiefs and sheriffs more than once. I'll never forget, for example, last September when I called the Brookhaven, Mississippi Police Department after two of their men were killed. Put that in context, they had an entire police force of 38 people. Unfortunately, we've already had two more officers shot and killed in the line of duty just this month. One was an officer killed in Arkansas this past Thursday. So I've mentioned only a few specific tragic incidents, but I cannot stress enough that this is a problem that affects cities and towns, big and small, all over the country. It can happen anywhere, it can happen anytime, and the level of violence against law enforcement in this country doesn't get a whole lot of national coverage, and I worry often that Americans don't realize the extent of the problem. That's may be understandable because they don't see what I see in my job, the devastating loss in each one of these instances to the loved ones left behind, and the loss to the FBI and to our communities of partners who, as I say, are so critical to our mission. Finally, I want folks to remember that the dangers of this work go beyond just encounters with potentially deadly criminals. Think of the line of duty deaths and illnesses that we're seeing now from our 9-11 first responders. I know that as director, I've spoken to not one, not two, but three of our own agents who died as a result of their work in response to those attacks. And there are countless other kinds of examples. So I know our country faces a daunting list of challenges, and I'm confident we're going to be discussing any number of them together at this hearing. But I do want to make sure folks around this country are not forgetting the good work of the people who are putting everything on the line. It takes an incredibly special person to be willing to put his or her life on the line for a complete stranger. And to get up every morning, day after day after day to do that, uh, I think is extraordinary. So I think we owe it to them and to their fallen comrades to do whatever we can to make their work safer we need to promote understanding and respect for their roles, and all of us as Americans owe them a profound debt of gratitude. So I appreciate the committee extending me the privilege and the honor as FBI director 
to honor their sacrifice uh, in this job. So I'd be happy to answer the committee's questions. Well, thank you, Director. Uh, that's a very good, sobering reminder of what it's like to get up every day to be a police officer. You don't know if you're going to come home. You don't know if the last time you say bye to your spouse or significant other or your children is the last time you see them. And every time somebody falls in battle, uh, we give them appropriate honor, but a lot of people fall in the line of duty and go unnoticed until right now. So, well done. So let's talk about foreign and domestic threats. That's what we're all really about at the FBI. Uh, do you have agents in uh, Afghanistan? Uh, we do have a few, yes. Okay. Uh, from your point of view, is the terrorist threats in Afghanistan, have they been extinguished to the homeland? Are there threats still alive and well in Afghanistan to the American homeland? Uh, we are concerned about developments in Afghanistan and the potential ramifications for Americans both uh, around the world and, and here at home. For the committee, there are more al-Qaeda folks than they were before 9-11. ISIS-K is one of the more lethal offshoots of ISIS, and they are in Afghanistan as I speak. Uh, sequestration. If sequestration goes back into effect, how would it affect your ability to operate? Uh, it, I would use the word devastating, uh, and I think you and I know each other well enough now to know that I don't tend to uh, use a lot of hyperbole. We at the FBI, uh, in a way that's different from some of our other agencies around the government, uh, an awful lot of that money would go straight to personnel costs, so our ability to keep people safe would uh, would most definitely be severely hampered. So devastating is a pretty accurate description. Uh, Section 215, uh, your authority is about to expire. Can you tell us about that? So uh, under the USA Freedom Act, there are really three provisions that are particularly relevant to the FBI that are set to expire uh, if we don't collectively act here. Uh, the first, and perhaps the most widely used, uh, is the business records provision, which we use routinely almost every day uh, under court supervision to collect all kinds of business records, uh, many of which would not be available under national security letters, for example. So that's something that we use all the time in our national security work. If you we lost also, that authority, how would that affect your ability to operate? It would affect our uh, counterterrorism mission profoundly. It would affect our counterintelligence mission profoundly. And increasingly, it would affect our cyber mission profoundly. Okay. And there are a couple other authorities. So uh, you're hoping for reauthorization? Is that your request to the committee? Well, certainly these are indispensable tools, uh, and I think we would look forward to working with Congress to make sure that we don't lose the ability to use these tools to keep Americans safe. They're all court supervised and subject to extensive oversight. So I mentioned in my opening statement the 2020 election. Do you have what you need to uh, provide election security from your lane, from the Congress? Do you have the money and the statutory authority you need? Well, uh, from our lane, of course, at the FBI, our primary focus is on the malign foreign influence piece. There's a separate election infrastructure piece that DHS deals with the states on more. Uh, we feel that we have significant resources devoted to the foreign influence piece and the president's budget uh, that's currently up uh, before the Congress asks for additional resources to help us do that. Is there any law that we need to change that would help you? You don't uh, have to answer right now. Just get back with me. We can always use more tools in the toolbox, but at the moment, I can't think of one on the foreign okay, influence that's piece fair specifically. Enough. Just get back with me. Uh, the Chinese. What are the Chinese up to when it comes to uh, counterintelligence operations and bad things? So, Mr. Chairman, I would say that there is no country that poses a more severe counterintelligence threat to this country right now. Uh, than China. And I That's say, saying a lot. That is saying a lot, uh, and I don't say it lightly. Who would be second? Uh, probably Russia. What's the difference between first and second? So, All so China part. is uh, fighting a generational fight here. Uh, and when I say China, I want to be clear. This is not about the Chinese people as a whole, and it's certainly not about Chinese Americans in this country. What it is about, though, is about a country that is in a variety of ways through the Chinese government, the Chinese Communist Party, using not just government officials, but private sector entities 
uh, non-traditional collectors, uh, et cetera, to steal their way up the economic ladder at our expense. Uh, and we have, as we speak, probably about a thousand plus investigations all across the country involving attempted theft of U.S. intellectual property, whether it's economic espionage or counterproliferation, almost all leading back to China. Uh, and so it is a threat that's deep and diverse and wide and vexing, whether it's in terms of the kinds of actors that are used, the kinds of techniques are used, the kind of targets that are used. Uh, and so we're working extremely hard with all of our partners to combat it. Uh, but make no mistake, this is a, a high, high priority for all of us. Is Russia, are the Russians still trying to interfere in our election system? The Russians are, are absolutely intent on trying to interfere uh, with our elections through foreign influence. Is it fair to say that foreign everything, influence in particular. everything we've done against Russia has not deterred them enough? All the sanctions, all the talk, they're still at it. Well, my view is until they stop, they haven't been deterred enough. And, and they're still doing it? Yes. Okay, good. So... Uh, some of us are concerned about the 2016 election in terms of bias. Do you trust Mr. Horowitz to be fair to the country as a whole when he looks at the FISA warrant process? I will say, uh, Mr. Chairman, in all my experience with Inspector General Horowitz, uh, that while he can be pretty hard hitting, he's independent, he's objective, he's fair, he's professional, he's thorough, uh, and I have no reason to doubt the, uh, the integrity or the quality of the investigation he has underway. When it comes to the counterintelligence investigation of the Trump campaign, is anybody providing kind of a deep dive to look at what happened there? Is that part of Mr. Horowitz's charter? Well, I, would, I think I would let uh, Inspector General Horowitz speak for himself about the okay. scope of his investigation, but as, as you know, uh, the Attorney General uh, has, has doing a review uh, or has, has commissioned some people that? to do a review. And I think that's part of his job. It's part of mine to get some of those questions answered. Thank you. Senator Feinstein. Thanks, Mr. Chairman. Um, Director, in May, 16 women filed a class action lawsuit against the Department of Justice, alleging gender, gender discrimination in FBI Academy training programs. You, of course, know this. The lawsuit accuses the FBI of intentionally allowing a good old boy network to flourish at the FBI Academy, which has directly led to subjective training standards by which female trainees are dismissed at a higher rate than their male counterparts. Is this true? What has been done to improve hiring and recruitment of female agencies? And has the FBI reviewed its academy's training program? So, Senator, uh, because the matter that you referred to is in pending lit litigation, I'm not going to be able to comment directly on the litigation itself. I but what I that. but what I will tell you uh, is that we are firmly committed to diversity as a core value, both gender diversity and other kinds of diversity. Uh, and I will also tell you uh, that we are making in my view, significant strides to improve the diversity of our workforce. In fact, could you uh, the, be specific? That sure, would be helpful. Uh, sure. The, the last few uh, basic field training courses, uh, our BFTC, which is our new agent classes, uh, have significantly higher uh, female representation than our current agent workforce. Uh, in fact, uh, we have gender diversity recruiting targets for every field office that are pretty aggressive, uh, and the recent classes uh, exceed or are about on par with those targets. So I think we're making a lot of progress. Uh, we we want to make sure it's done in the right way. Information I'm sorry? Right. Could we receive some of that information in writing? Sure, we'd be happy Could to see what we can provide. In general, but I'd be interested in some of the specifics. Former mayor went through some of the same issues with police department. Well, it's, it's something that I think is extremely important to uh, our work at the FBI. Uh, I think diversity, for me, is, is about our ability to uh, make better decisions. I think we're all more effective when we have a variety of viewpoints. I think it's important to our credibility with the public. And I think it's important as a matter of respect. Has the FBI reviewed its academy's training programs? 
we are taking a look at how things are working down at the academy. Have you made any changes? Uh, I'm not sure I have any changes I can describe right now, but maybe we could get back to your office with a little more information about that. Yeah, I'd appreciate it if you would get back to us um, with any training programs that assure equal treatment of female candidates and strategies to improve recruitment. Uh, I went through this as mayor of San Francisco, and I know it's painful, but I also know it's right. So um, I'd appreciate knowing what's happening. Um, according to Special Counsel Mueller's report, the FBI embedded personnel with Mueller's team, whose purpose, and this is a quote, was to review the results of the investigation and to send in writing summaries of foreign intelligence and counterintelligence information to FBI headquarters and FBI field offices, end quote. The Mueller report says that these summaries <coughs> contain information that's not included in the Mueller report itself. Have you reviewed these summaries and information? Well, Senator, I, I want to be careful uh, not to be discussing the special counsel's report, especially when the special counsel himself uh, is going to be testifying well, at length tomorrow. Statement. But My understanding is they're outside of the report per se. W what I would say is that as the report itself uh, describes or, or explains, there have been a number of referrals uh, that have been made to the FBI, uh, but beyond that I really don't feel comfortable commenting at this have point. Have you seen any summaries of information? Uh, I have seen information that's come out of the special counsel's report. I'll on just leave issue. it at that. Uh, on a variety of issues. Well, Congress hasn't seen them, have they? Have we? I don't know for sure, Senator, exactly what, what different members of Congress have seen relative to this subject. Well, would you make them available to Congress? I'd be happy to, to talk with our folks. I know we're having engagement with uh, both, the, both of the intelligence committees, and I can see where things stand in terms of information sharing I, I that may make, be relevant to this topic. I would make that request. Okay. Um, the Mueller investigation confirmed that Paul Manafort Trump's campaign manager, spent several years working for Oleg Deripaska, a Russian oligarch, quote, who was closely aligned by Vladimir Putin, that's in the Mueller report. And Mueller uncovered that during the presidential campaign, Manafort provided Deripaska, quote, private briefings, end quote. Manafort also funneled internal campaign strategy, polling and messaging, for the battleground states of Michigan, Wisconsin, Pennsylvania, and Minnesota to Deripaska. That's volume one of the Mueller report. Finally, we know Manafort told special counsel Mueller that, quote, if Trump won, Deripaska would want to use Manafort to advance whatever interests Deripaska had in the United States and elsewhere. Question, did the FBI assess the impact of Manafort providing this specific and significant campaign information to Russian intelligence. Well, Senator, I, there was a, uh, yes. an yes. awful amount of work done by a huge team of professionals that resulted in a 450-something page report, and I really want to be careful not to be trying to add my own gloss or layering on top of that, uh, especially with Special Counsel Mueller testifying tomorrow. So I'm going to leave it at that for now. All right. And I, I would ask for a confidential briefing then on this subject. And you can say yes or no, but I, I will request it. Um, did the FBI determine whether any of this information ended up in the hands of the IRA? Uh, there's really nothing I can say on that subject okay. here, Senator. Okay. All right. I have my time is almost up. Um, I'm going to leave it at that. Thank okay. you. Thank you, Senator Lee. Thank you very much, and thank you for being here, Mr. Ray. Um, tell me what the biggest change you've experienced has been. Uh, since you've taken your current position? 
Well, I, I appreciate the fact that increasingly I find, uh, as I've made my way from one corner of the country, one corner of the country to another, visiting all the field offices, meeting with law enforcement in every state, community partners in every state, private sector partners in every state, that increasingly out in the rest of America, people are, are recognizing that the FBI has had more than two investigations over the last few years. Right. In May, Attorney General Barr noted that to the extent there was overreach uh, in connection with the 2016 election, it seems to have been a few people at the top getting it into their heads that they know better than the American people. We know what happened in part because we've seen text messages between FBI investigators that show a strong bias against then-candidate Donald Trump. These texts suggest that the agents saw the purpose of their investigation as being very specific. That is, to stop Donald Trump from becoming president of the United States. Given the FBI's immense investigative power, these reports are, I'm sure you would agree, troubling. Uh, and it, it's uh, been an ongoing concern that the Bureau's history uh, uh, has been one that um, has involved a deliberate and through most of its history, I think, a successful effort to make sure that its reputation precedes it and to make sure that um, it stays out of politics and that it sticks to uh, down the line law enforcement. I understand you've made some personnel changes in response to what happened in 2016. Uh, um, tell me what else you're doing and uh, are there internal practices and procedures that you can change or implement to make sure that the FBI uses its power appropriately and to make sure that things like this don't happen? Uh, thank you, Senator. I welcome the question. Uh, I would say a couple of things. First, um, one of the primary messages I have tried to impart to every single FBI audience everywhere I go is that our reputation as an agency, I think, revolves less around our wins and victories and successes over 111 years and more on the way in which we've accomplished those wins. And when we've made mistakes, and over 111 years, we've made our share of mistakes. The key is whether we learn from them. But we need to be in a position with every investigation, every intelligence analysis, that we can say when we get criticized or when somebody's not happy with the result of it, and there's always somebody who's not happy, we need to be able to say, hey, I get it. You may not like where it ended up, but you can't really challenge the integrity and objectivity and professionalism of how we got there. So as you say, uh, I've made personnel changes. Uh, I've turned over essentially the entire leadership team. Uh, second, we put in place uh, a number of new policies. Third, uh, I did a full day of training for starting at the top on the theory that a tone starts at the top. So I brought all of the SES workforce across the entire FBI around the world for a day at Quantico. And we had the inspector general's office, we had judges, we had people like that trying to remind everybody that it's not just objectivity in what we do, but the appearance of objectivity in what we do that's so important. I will say, I will say that uh, while we've certainly, as I said, had mistakes and we've taken appropriate disciplinary action when that has occurred, that my experience with the FBI, and I say that I think with a pretty informed basis for it now, is that it is full, top to bottom, of hardworking professionals of the highest integrity, incredible commitment to service over self, uh, and I'm proud every day to work with them. Uh, thank you. Does the FBI or the administration as a whole have a position on the reauthorization of the expiring authorities under uh, the USA Freedom Act? Uh, I don't think the administration has taken uh, an official position, although, as I said uh, to uh, Chairman Graham, there are three provisions in particular that are uh, keenly relevant to the FBI that, at least my experience has been, are relatively non-controversial, extremely important to our work, and all subject to court supervision. Uh, those are the business records provision that we talked about, the roving wiretap provision, uh, which is essentially equivalent to what already exists under Title III on the criminal side, um, and the lone wolf provision, which although it has not been used yet, that is really more because we've chosen to try to use other tools where we can, and the way the counterterrorism threat is evolving, we predict that over the next few years, 
the lone wolf provision will become more and more important. So we would hate to see it disappear. The collection of call detail records, uh, or CDRs, uh, is authorized by Section 215 of the Patriot Act, Patriot Act and, and is subsequently modified by the USA Freedom Act, has been the subject of a fair amount of scrutiny after it was reported recently that, uh, or, or after the NSA, rather, publicly reported that in June of 2018, it was deleting three years' worth of CDR records due to what they referred to as technical irregularities in the data provided to the NSA from the telecommunications providers, um, leading to the receipt of certain uh, CDRs that NSA, um, quote, was not authorized to receive. In March of this year, uh, the New York Times and the Wall Street Journal both reported that the NSA had shut down the entire CDR pro collection program in 2018 and was considering ending the program entirely. What's the current status of the CDR program? Well, uh, Senator, as you alluded to in your question, that's really an NSA authority, and I would really defer to them for the kind of the latest and greatest on that. Is, um, don't you think the abuse of that or the impropriety of its collection has to be something that we take into account in deciding uh, whether or in what way to reauthorize these programs? Well, certainly, I think uh, the Congress uh, should make a thoughtful decision about reauthorization of any of the provisions uh, in the USA Freedom Act. Um, and I think, you know, questions of, uh, of errors or irregularities or even abuses are appropriate for the Congress to take into account. But the specifics about the CDR program, I'm really going to defer to NSA on. Okay. There, the three provisions I listed off are the ones that the FBI uh, is most focused on. Thank you. Senator Durbin. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Ray, welcome. I'd like to ask you a question. Do you know what group was responsible for more homicides from 2000 to 2016 more than any other domestic extremist group? Uh, I'm not sure, but I, I trust you're about to tell me. Not a trick question. I just. I, I raise that question because your testimony uh, that was submitted to the committee talked a lot about homegrown violent extremists. In an unclassified FBI DHS Joint Intelligence Bulletin in May 2017 found that white supremacist extremism poses a persistent threat of lethal violence. Went on to say that white supremacists were responsible for more homicides from 2000 to 2016 than any other domestic extremist movement. Seven members of the committee uh, joined me in writing a letter to you and Attorney General Barr uh, explaining our concern about whether the FBI and Department of Justice were taking adequate measures to combat white <coughs> supremacist violence and minimizing this growing domestic terrorism threat. The term white supremacist, white nationalist is not included in your statement uh, to the committee when you talk about threats to America. There is a reference to racism which I think probably was meant to include that, but nothing more specific. We live in a world where the neo-Nazis and white supremacists are taking lives uh, in many places. A white supremacist murdered 51 Muslim worshipers in New Zealand. 2017, a white supremacist murdered six Muslim worshipers at a mosque in Quebec City, Canada. And in the United States, far-right extremists perpetrated the shootings at the Sikh Temple in Oak Creek, Wisconsin, the Emanuel African Methodist Episcopal Church in Charleston, South Carolina, the Tree of Life Synagogue in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, and the Shabbat of Poway, I'm sorry if I mispronounced that, Poway, Poway? Uh, Synagogue in Poway, California. The reason I raise this is because there is a concern that this is not being taken as seriously as it should be, as one of the real threats in our country. And a concern as well that the FBI has now changed its definition when it comes to race-related crimes. They've created a new category for what you term racially motivated, motivated violent extremism. It used to be uh, white supremacist incidents. Could you explain to me uh, why there was this change, whether you consider this a serious threat, and what you're doing about it? 
I, I ask you this in the context of a national conversation that's taking place every single day under this presidency about the issue of race and incitements to emotion and violence by the people who are using race as the motivator. So, Senator, uh, first, uh, let me sort of unpack your question a little bit. Uh, needless to say, we take domestic terrorism or hate crime, regardless uh, of ideology, extremely seriously, I can assure you. Uh, and we are aggressively pursuing it, uh, using both <coughs> counterterrorism resources and criminal investigative resources and partnering closely with our state and local partners. In just the last little while, we've had cases involving, for example, the Coast Guard lieutenant uh, who was planning an attack on elected officials and TV anchors here in this area. We've had militia white, members. Was that motivated by a white supremacy belief? I think it would be a version of that, certainly. Uh, we, our focus, when you asked about the categorization, our focus is on the violence. We don't, we the FBI, don't investigate ideology no matter how repugnant. We investigate violence. And any extremist ideology, when it turns to violence, we're all over it. Uh, and we've had, in fact, and that you don't have to just take my word for it, you know, just in the first three quarters of this year, uh, we've had more domestic terrorism arrests than the prior year. And it's about the same number of arrests as we have on the international terrorism side. I ask you to clarify that because when you talk, I don't know if we're talking about the same thing, but when you talk about homegrown violent extremists and I talk about domestic violent extremists, are we talking about the same thing? No. So uh, we use the term homegrown violent extremism to refer to people already here in the United States who are inspired by different parts of the global jihadist movement to commit terrorist acts. Okay, we I use get the that. term domestic terrorism to refer to uh, a broader array of threats ranging from anarchist extremism to uh, different kinds of racially motivated violent extremism to different kinds of environmental uh, extremism, et cetera. So let me, yeah. let me pursue that for a second. So the point I'm getting to, and the reason I quoted this unclassified report, is if it's violence that motivates the FBI investigation. What we have here is a statement in this unclassified joint intelligence report that between the years 2000 and 2016, the white supremacists were responsible for more homicides than any other domestic extremism movement. Now, I, I see the distinction you're making, homegrown versus domestic. But l let me ask you, can you quantify either one of them for us? Well, I, in terms of number of arrests, we have, uh, through the uh, third quarter of this fiscal year, uh, had about give or take 100 arrests in the international terrorism side, which includes the homegrown violent extremism. This year. This year. But we've also had just about the same number, again, don't quote me to the exact digit, uh, on the domestic terrorism side. And I will say that a uh, majority of the um, domestic terrorism uh, cases that we've investigated uh, are motivated by some version of what you might call white supremacist violence, think, but it includes other things as well. I think this is significant. I do not want to diminish the work that you're doing when it comes to the homegrown domestic terrorism in any way whatsoever, not at all. And I understand that as a serious threat to the United States, We and 9-11 is proof positive of that fact. But what you have just said is significant. If the number of people arrested this calendar year when it comes to this extremist conduct is about equal, between those who were inspired by foreign actors, ISIS, Al-Qaeda, whatever it might be, and those who were inspired by white supremacy or at least some version of race. Now, if that's the way I heard you say it, so let, please clarify. So let me clarify. What I just gave you were the number of arrests. The number of arrests. That's not necessarily the same thing as the number of investigations. Well, let's arrest right? So that's an important a, distinction. Assuming the integrity of your department, which I will, uh, the fact that they would make an arrest, it is with the belief that a crime has been committed. The point I'm getting to is we are in a very tense moment in American history on the issue of race. We are having a national conversation that we haven't had in a long time about racism and the reaction, what's acceptable and what is not. And what I'm asking you from the FBI point of view and what you've told me 
is that we ought to take care as seriously as we take foreign inspired terrorism there is a domestic terrorism underway in the name of race uh, that is as threatening in some respects as the foreign terrorism. That's the way I hear it. Yeah, I don't know that I, I, I think the greatest terrorist threat to the homeland is the homegrown violent extremist. I will say that this we would be take foreign, domestic, in, foreign which, inspired, which is the hottest home, inspired you, violence. That does not mean by any stretch of the imagination that we don't take domestic terrorism, including hate crime committed on behalf of some kind of white supremacist ideology extremely seriously. And we have had a number of very significant arrests. Uh, I mentioned the Coast Guard one, but we had militia members in Cleveland stockpiling explosives to build pipe bombs. We had the Cesar Sea case involving the package IED. We had uh, the Rise Above movement uh, where we uh, arrested eight different people on federal rioting charges. One of them fled to El Salvador and we got him back. We had the Tree of Life synagogue shooting case, which you mentioned, uh, and the shooting outside San Diego, the, uh, the attack in the synagogue there. Uh, we got a 29 count, I think it was, conviction and life sentence uh, related to the Charlottesville matter. So uh, make no mistake, the FBI working with our state and local uh, law enforcement partners is all over this. Thank you very much. Senator, Senator Cornyn. Director Ray, thank you for opening your remarks with a, your uh, tribute to local, state, and federal law enforcement officers. It's uh, really important for all of us, not just the professional law enforcement officers you represent, but to the entire nation to acknowledge and honor uh, these uh, heroes for their service and sacrifice. So thank you for that. You may be interested to know that it's uh, this Friday it'll be my honor to deliver the Congressional Badge of Bravery to a group of Houston FBI agents for their work during Hurricane Harvey which uh, was particularly signif a particularly significant event in my state. And uh, so on, on uh, their behalf, let me thank you and all of the uh, rank and file FBI agents that do such a great job every day. You'll recall that on November the 5th, 2017, Devin Patrick Kelly killed 26 worshipers at a little Baptist church outside of San Antonio in Sutherland Springs. He injured 20 more people, devastating that community, as we could imagine. We found out that uh, Mr. Kelly was a convicted felon. He had a record of being detained for mental health reasons. He was con had been convicted of domestic violence, um, actually even fracturing his uh, stepson's skull during one particular episode. He should never have been able to purchase firearms uh, through a licensed firearm dealer because he would have, should have failed a background check. But he did uh, what uh, we find is uh, unfortunately uh, not entirely uncommon. He lied and then he bought uh, these weapons he used to commit this uh, terrible uh, tragic e uh, event. Uh, so Congress passed a piece of legislation, as you know, called Fix NICS, Fix the National Instant Criminal Background che Check System to try to encourage uh, federal agencies to um, provide records of people who are already legally disqualified under current law. And of course, as you know, that background check system is maintained by the FBI. Could you give us a um, update on uh, what the impact has been, uh, just in general terms? Well, I certainly, Senator, I, I agree with you that uh, the NICS system only works at its best when we have complete information that ensures the goal we all share of making sure that people who are legally prohibited from possessing firearms don't get their hands on them. Uh, last year, I think the uh, NICS, the FBI's NICS system had, I think, 100,000 plus or thereabouts uh, denials. Uh, and certainly we're, we're seeing progress in terms of the agencies that had not supplied records, you know, starting to do that. Uh, I don't have the exact, you know, percentage of how far along we are, but we're certainly making progress, and we appreciate your leadership uh, in ensuring that that uh, that we move in that direction. Would you uh, agree with me that, in all probability, Congress's response to that terrible tragedy in Sutherland Springs by reforming the Fix NICS, uh, the background check system, has probably saved lives? I do think so. I do think so. 
Director Ray, I was in Austin, Texas with uh, Senator Warner and Senator Burr, who are the chair and vice chair of the Senate Intelligence Committee uh, at a program hosted by TechNet for the technology community there in, in Austin, which is, uh, as you know, robust and growing. Um, Bill Priestap, who at the time was head of the counterintelligence division at the FBI, made a presentation, uh, particularly about the Chinese, the, the China threat. Um, and uh, I think it was an eye-opening uh, uh, eye opening presentation for a lot of the folks who were there. Uh, one I remember in particular said he thought that once the United States issued a visa to somebody that they had performed a security background check on that person and they were not a threat to the United States national security. Um, Mr. Priestap uh, made the point that in the old days it was spy versus spy, but now it's uh, spy versus a whole host of unconventional uh, and informal collectors. Um, I know the FBI has done its best to try to spread that word, um, but can you tell me sort of what your uh, record has been in doing that and whether you think that there's more that needs to be done by Congress or I know the FBI has got its hands full. It can't necessarily go around and make presentations like this all across the country while you're trying to keep the bad guys uh, off the streets. But is there more that we need to do to supplement the efforts of the FBI to educate the American people on this threat? Well, I, I will say when it comes to Congress's role, uh, I have, despite the bitterly polarized political environment that we all live in right now, I've actually been heartened by, on this particular issue, uh, every time I appear in front of a committee of Congress from, from one end of the spectrum to the other, compared to earlier stages in my career in law enforcement, the level of alignment and consensus about the importance of confronting this threat in a more thoughtful and effective way, uh, I think is, is source for cheer. And so the more Congress can raise awareness, uh, I think the more we can appropriately protect the country. I will say that uh, there's a lot that people, I think, in this country don't understand about the nature of the China threat. Uh, it is not just, as you say, spy versus spy, traditional intelligence operatives. We, there are a slew of what we call non-traditional collectors, businessmen, scientists, uh, high-level academics, uh, graduate students, et cetera, people who are not intelligence officers by profession, but who are, for a variety of reasons, working on behalf of the Chinese government. And I think sometimes people don't understand the degree to which lines that we all revere and cherish in this country are in blurred, if not entirely eliminated, in China. The difference between the Chinese government and the Chinese Communist Party, not really a difference. The difference between the Chinese government and its private sector is not really a difference. And why do I say that? Well, I say that because under Chinese law, uh, most companies in China are either already literally state-owned enterprises, so essentially just an arm of the state for that reason, or legally or practically beholden to the Chinese Communist Party. Different aspects of Chinese law require those companies to basically provide whatever information the Chinese government or the Chinese Communist Party wants, uh, essentially upon demand. And, and I think a lot of people don't understand this fact. Virtually any company from China of any size is required to have inside it a Chinese Communist Party cell or committee to ensure that the company adheres to Chinese Communist Party policies. Uh, so when those folks are out trying to, through legitimate means or illegitimate means, steal intellectual property, that's what we're talking about. It's a counterintelligence threat. And we have in the last uh, several months had a whole variety of cases hackers associated with the Chinese MSS who uh, were engaged in an extensive campaign of intrusions against something like 45 different companies, 12 different states, lots of countries. We had an MSS officer who was trying to, who's been charged in Ohio, who's been trying to steal aviation secrets from companies there. Different Chinese MSS officers, an entire team of hackers that were involved uh, in a five-year campaign of repeated intrusions. We had a Chinese uh, state-owned enterprise, uh, which along with a couple of individuals was trying to steal trade secrets from a company in Idaho. We had a guy in Chicago uh, 
Senator Durbin, who was working with the MSS to recruit employees of clear defense contractors. We had a guy in Oklahoma who was stealing over a billion dollars of confidential proprietary information from a U.S. energy company. We had, of course, and I even got into the Huawei case where they were charged literally from coast to coast with a campaign of fraud, intellectual property theft, and obstruction of justice. And I could go on and on and on. It affects basically every industry in this country and agriculture. It affects the private sector. It affects academia. Uh, it affects, it involves human operations. It involves cyber operations. To be clear, we welcome competition. We welcome academic freedom, but cheating, not okay. Fraud, not okay. Cyber hacking, not okay. And as long as they keep committing crimes and threatening our national security, they're going to keep encountering the FBI. Thank you. Other than that, are we in a pretty good shape with China? <laughs> <laughs> it's in our White House. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you, Director Ray. Um, I'd like to take you back to the FBI's role in the uh, Kavanaugh background investigation, if I may. Um, there were two letters that were sent to you by law firms uh, in that time frame. One pointed out that the Federal Bureau of Investigation, I'm quoting the letter here, declined to interview witnesses whose names we provided to the FBI as possessing information highly relevant to the allegations. And um, the other referenced agents meeting with a witness whose counsel then quote, provided the FBI with a list of more than 20 additional witnesses likely to have relevant information, and that letter actually attached an affidavit from a very apparently credible person who had been at college at the time, was currently an emergency room physician and so forth, uh, and evidently there was no follow-up on that either. I'd like to ask those two letters to be made a part of the record. Um, we also experienced on this committee considerable difficulty in finding out where the point of entry would be to the FBI for information. I've been a U.S. attorney. I work closely with the FBI as a Rhode Island's attorney general. I have never known the FBI to be fending off information before. So this was a very novel and peculiar circumstance in which witnesses weren't being interviewed and in which when we asked to find out where the point of entry was for information, there was none, apparently. You were asked to provide committee confidential contact information for an FBI agent to whom members can send credible contacts regarding individuals seeking to be interviewed. Did that ever happen? Well, Senator, I, w I don't remember all the specifics of that particular background investigation, but what I will say, uh, you referenced uh, your prior experience as U.S. Attorney, and of course we've talked about that before. I think it's important for people to understand that there's a fundamental difference between a background investigation and the kinds of criminal investigations or even counterintelligence investigations the FBI does every day. Yes, as a background said, investigation is something that we do in a completely different way as an investigative service provider to a client agency. In this case, it would have been correct. the White House. And I have you testified to Senator Harris in right. the Homeland Security Committee, our supplemental update to the previous background investigation was limited in scope, and it was limited in scope by the White House. That's correct? I also testified, uh, I did testify to that, yep. and I stand by that testimony. I would also say, though, I, as I recall, I also testified that I consulted at length with our security professionals who are specialists in background investigations to make sure that that investigation, that background investigation, was done consistent with our longstanding policies, practices, and procedures for background investigations, where the scope, it's not unusual for the scope to be limited. So here's my hypothesis. Um, you are, don't recall whether you responded to this letter by seeing to it that there was an FBI agent to whom members could send credible contacts. I don't believe there was, because I was trying to you know, vector information to the right place, and every door we turned to closed or said, no, go to that door, and then that door closed or said, no, go to that door. The ultimate upshot, it seemed to me, um, was that the FBI established a tip line. And if people wanted to bring in information, they were told to call into the tip line. Now, I've tried to find out what the protocol is for dealing with tip lines. Um, and I would ask that 
as a question for the record, you provide me whatever is relevant to the standard operating procedure and practice for the FBI with respect to the treatment of tip line information when it comes in. Would you be willing to do that? I'd be happy to provide you more information about tip lines. Thank you. What I did find was uh, an FBI video that describes how tip lines work when it comes in through uh, the FBI's FBI.gov interface. Um, the first step, it says, is that it comes into the public access center unit at FBI headquarters. Analysts will vet them. They'll review them for believability, credibility, check internal databases and external databases to verify the information is a valid tip. Can you vouch that those steps were undertaken with respect to the Kavanaugh background investigation tip line? What I can tell you, Senator, is that I spoke specifically with the people responsible for the background investigation who are career professionals specializing in background investigations, not to be confused with criminal investigations or counterintelligence investigations. Uh, and I was assured repeatedly that they felt comfortable that the way it was being handled was consistent with our practices, procedures, and longstanding there approach. There hadn't been a tip line before in a background investigation ever, had there? I, I don't know the answer to that. Okay, I don't think there was, so it's hard to say that it's consistent with procedures. Uh, here is what the, the procedures apparently are. Another one is every single tip is looked at by at least two individuals who have independent quality assurance checks. Do you know if that procedure was followed with respect to the Kavanaugh investigation tip line? Well, Senator, I would again come back to the answer I gave, which is I expect that background investigations, which are different, fundamentally different from criminal investigations and counterintelligence investigations, but you don't were know. being conducted in a way that the professionals who specialize in this area felt comfortable. But you don't know whether or not the tip line procedures were followed. I, I'm not familiar. Line. I don't have the document in front of me that you're looking at. I haven't talked specifically okay. about that. So Then it says, once a tip is determined to have further investigative merit, a supervisor would actually review the tip and at that point, it gets vectored into electronic systems for further processing. And I guess if you're not familiar with whether that supervisory step took place either. Uh, what I am familiar with is the assurances I've received. I got it. Yeah, I, know, right. I heard that. Okay. Um, I'm just trying to ask something more specific. Uh, and the last is every single piece of information that's submitted by an individual is reviewed by FBI personnel at FBI headquarters. And again, you, you can't vouch for that having taken place with respect to this tip line. I, I can't speak to that specifically. Got it. Okay. You know, here's my concern, and I'll be perfectly candid about it, and you can answer however you want in questions for the record to allay my concerns. But it looked to me like every time somebody went to try to get an FBI agent to take information, they got fended off, and that the tip line actually became a tip dump into which information was dumped and never, ever reviewed for credibility and was not treated with the uh, protocol that the FBI has announced uh, that it usually handles with tip lines. So I'm happy to continue this conversation. My time is up right now, but please, I think that's a legitimate question to ask, and I hope that in answers for the record, you'll be able to compare the protocols that the FBI uses for tip lines with the way in which this particular tip line was handled by the FBI. And I do understand that you treat these differently and that they don't follow ordinary procedure. But ordinary procedure is a fairly reasonable benchmark, and I'm interested in finding out how close you came, how close the FBI came to it in this particular tip line. Well, I'd, I'd be happy to see if we can provide you more information uh, as follow-up to your questions. Uh, again, I would say that ordinary procedure, to use your phrase, um, there's ordinary procedure for criminal investigations and counterintelligence investigations. Ordinary procedure for background investigations is something different, in my view. Couldn't agree with you more, and once we agree on what the facts are of what took place, we can have a discussion about whether or not that met standards of kind of basic responsibility. Thank you. Okay. Senator Sass. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Director Ray, thanks for being here. I'd like to talk about human trafficking, uh, one of the great scourges of our time. There are more slaves on Earth now than at any point in human history. Uh, thank you for the work of the Bureau in the Jeffrey Epstein case. Um, that monster is in the process of being brought to justice, uh, and your agents have done good work in that regard. Let's zoom back out from an individual case, though, to the bigger picture. When is it appropriate for trafficking cases to be investigated by state and local and highway patrol versus the Bureau? How do you divide the responsibilities? Well, uh 
as a general rule, we take the approach with human trafficking that we do with most uh, threats where there's overlapping uh, responsibility, which is we look at where we at the FBI can most add value to the common fight against whatever the threat is. And so in the case of human trafficking, we probably spend more of our efforts on the FBI side focused on sex trafficking and sex trafficking of kids than, for example, on labor trafficking of adults. Doesn't mean we don't investigate the others, but we try to work with other agencies to try to share the load. But where we think we can most add value uh, is on going after those who traffic of traffic kids for sex. Uh, and we have extensive investigations. In fact, just this month, ongoing, we have uh, something called Operation Independence Day. And I think at last count, about halfway through the month, we'd already rescued something like rescued or recovered about 40 kids just, just this month. It's ongoing. It will end at the end of the month. Um, part of that, part of the reason I make that distinction uh, is because uh, there are th skill sets we can provide and offer that I think are uniquely relevant to dealing with child victims, for example. Uh, there are authorities that we have that help us investigate more effectively you know, some of the online uh, effectiveness that, uh, that some of the traffickers have. Um, and so those are some of the ways I think we contribute uniquely, but it's a very much of a common fight. We have task forces all over the, uh, the country, I think about 85 uh, child exploitation and human trafficking task forces that work, that have uh, partners, and I mentioned in my opening statement how much we rely on state and local law enforcement. Lots and lots and lots of state and local law enforcement officers are on those task forces uh, all over the country. So we really do try to go at it together. There are great task forces in the Bureau and at state and local levels as well. The Nebraska Attorney General, Doug Peterson, has stood up a task force that's very impressive. Uh, Creighton University in Omaha has a bunch of researchers who've been studying the, the moving of brothels that have uh, kids in them and average brothel size. That that they've studied often has three to five kids and they move around uh, connected to sporting events. But again, praising the work because there's clearly new uh, focus at the Bureau on this, so this is not retrospective critical. Um, but forward looking, I'm skeptical that we have nearly enough resources uh, on this problem when we know that tens of thousands of kids are marketed uh, online any given month. And a lot of these brothels of three to five kids move by sporting event, they're crossing state lines. Uh, do you think that we have enough resources in the Bureau dedicated to child sex trafficking? Well, we're devoting a lot of resources to it, uh, but I will tell you that any additional resources Congress would see fit to give us, uh, I can assure you will be put to good use. It, uh, is absolutely horrifying that in the 21st century, this kind of activity can happen in our country. I mean, it's borderline medieval. And some of these kids are just uh, heartbreakingly young uh, and utterly helpless. Uh, and so the more resources we can bring to the fight, uh, both on the federal side, but also state and local law enforcement, but also, frankly, we work very closely with uh, NGOs uh, and various other forms of organizations to try to help prevent some of this activity. Uh, a lot of, uh, is a, a, a big role for awareness raising in this space as well from a prevention perspective. Because while well, on the one hand, I'm thrilled when we recover a child, on the other hand, I'm realist uh, and heartbroken because I know that kid will never be the same. Um, th there's a lot of estimates that somewhere around a majority, we don't use the term child prostitution anymore because it's not a, a, a crime that has consent in it, so we use the term child rape, but of the broad category of prostitution, the assumption is that probably a majority of prostitution in the U.S. involves people under 21, and of those over 21, some large share of them were trafficked into this before they were 21. So uh, we call it medieval, but it does seem like it's a, it's a particularly pernicious modern scourge uh, because the numbers seem greater now than at any point in history. Do we have a national strategy to combat it? And if so, who's in charge of it? Uh, well, I know that we work very collaboratively with a whole host of other agencies in the federal government, for example, uh, you know, ranging from the Department of Labor to uh, the Department of State, uh, because there's a huge role there, uh, to the Department of Health and Human Services. Uh, I can remember specific meetings I've been to with other uh, cabinet uh, secretaries specifically focused on, focused on human trafficking. So it's a, 
it's clearly one of these things that is a multidisciplinary problem requiring a multidisciplinary approach, and I think that's what uh, the administration is bringing to it. Um, I only have a little bit of time left, but I want to set up a set of questions for you that I'll follow up with you on later and or for the record. But following on your answers to Senator Cornyn about IP theft and our counterintelligence efforts against the Chinese uh, in the U.S. And, and the places where there is so much intellectual property being stolen, if you were be able to give the sort of elevator pitch uh, to a bunch of folks in Silicon Valley about what the Chinese strategy is when they deal with them, Senator Cornyn used the example of those of us on the Intelligence Committee who've had conversations with tech CEOs who believe because people are given visas into the US, they've already been vetted. Obviously, that's not the case, and these are regular assets of the Chinese government, uh, and I appreciate the distinctions you wanted to collapse between Chinese nominally private sector institutions and the government, and the distinction between the government and the Communist Party as being distinctions regularly without a difference. If you were explaining your elevator pitch to Silicon Valley CEOs when they're approached by Chinese investors um, and by Chinese computer scientists, What's the shorthand of the way you would try to put them on notice about how IP theft is organized from Beijing? Well, I think you, you can look at, for example, the various five-year plans the Chinese have for technologies that they're uh, seeking to achieve dominance in. Uh, and then you can look at some of the cases that we've brought, which I think raise uh, awareness. And what you know is that, that either through lawful means, joint ventures, foreign investment, et cetera, or in some cases, just out and out criminal means, IP theft, cyber intrusions, et cetera, uh, they are determined to uh, push themselves up the economic ladder at other people's expense, at the US uh, and our partners' expense. Uh, and so I think anybody, whether it's in a Silicon Valley startup or a Fortune 100 company, needs to be clear-eyed and thoughtful about who they get into business with uh, because uh, the road is long with victims of this uh, and a lot of those companies wish they could get it back. I think of there's a company that I remember in Massachusetts that went down this road uh, and then saw once they had gotten too far in, saw its stock drop you know, 40 something percent in one day uh, because once they were finished with them, they moved on. Uh, so it, it doesn't mean we shouldn't do business with the Chinese. It doesn't mean we shouldn't have Chinese visitors. It doesn't mean we shouldn't try to coexist with China as a country on the world stage, but it does mean <laughs> that there are certain kinds of behavior that violates criminal laws, uh, and we're not gonna tolerate it. And it doesn't matter whether it's Chinese or anybody else, we're gonna hold people accountable, and I don't really care what some foreign government has to say about it. Thank you. Senator Klobuchar. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Director Ray, you uh, have previously said uh, that foreign interference in the 2016 um, presidential election and what we just saw in 2018 in terms of the work that was done was a dress rehearsal for the big show of the 2020 elections. Um, and we've had a briefing on this. We know that Special Counsel um, Mueller uh, made clear how the Russians interfered in the 2016 election in his report, in his words, in a sweeping and systematic fashion. Uh, I have made clear that I disagree with uh, how the president has handled this uh, in his meetings with Vladimir Putin, where he has made jokes about it uh, just recently at the G20, where he actually uh, basically said he sided with him over his own intelligence. I'm not going to ask you about that, uh, but I'm going to ask you if you have previously briefed uh, the president about, um, if you personally briefed the president about these threats. Uh, we have had a number of meetings uh, with others in the National Security Council to include the president uh, that deal with uh, Russian efforts to interfere with, uh, say, the midterms and going forward and things and that we're doing going forward. Were you aware of the, the report where it said that uh, former director Nielsen uh, had been told by officials in the White House to not brief the president on it because it wasn't a good idea for her to do that? Not beyond what I saw in the press coverage that you just mentioned. Okay. So I, I look at how we solve things, and one of the ways I think it would be helpful to solve this is if there was an intrusion in our election. I've heard you talk about how there's two different 
ways to look at this. One is the physical hacking and one is the propaganda. And so one of the things that I think would be helpful would be to have backup paper ballots uh, and audits in case that hacking occurs. Do you think that would be helpful for our democracy? Well, uh, as you know, Senator, I think the, the responsibility for election infrastructure, so things like paper ballots, is more in the lane of DHS and its interaction with state and local officials uh, in the election space, although my limited layman understanding in that space is that paper ballots would be a good thing, and it seems to me that redundancy would be in everybody's interest in this such an important space for the country. I appreciate that. Um, and then secondly, on... Um uh, propaganda issues and particularly um, purchased ads. As you know, last time Russia actually purchased ads with r rubles. Um, do you think it would be helpful to know uh, what those ads are in this next upcoming election, whether they're paid for by Russia or China or uh, by any outside group, to know what they are and who paid for them? Well, uh, we certainly are trying to take a number of steps to raise awareness uh, and working with private sector entities which um, provide platforms for different forms of uh, foreign influence messaging, whether it's propaganda, fake news, or something else. But wouldn't it and be so, helpful just to know the facts? Well, I, I tend to believe that more information is better than less, mm -hmm. and I tend to believe that the American public will be better hardened against this threat with greater uh, media literacy uh, and resilience. Okay. Uh, Thank you. I just want to point out one bill I have with Senator Graham, which would uh, force those companies uh, to actually, the social media companies, put out there who paid for the ads and what they are, uh, so we don't have a patchwork system when it comes to the next election. And the second is that Senator Lankford and I had the Secure Elections Act, which would have firmly required backup paper ballots if anyone gets federal election money. Um, the first, the, the second bill was just stopped in its tracks by the White House, and it very much alarms me. Uh, I want to follow up on what uh, Senator Durbin was asking about, and I want to just focus not on the, the homegrown terrorism, which we've seen some of in Minnesota, so I'm well aware of the FBI's work on that front. And I also want to thank you on the other end of the bombing at the mosque, uh, where your agents were incredibly helpful and helped solve that crime. Um, and... Um, uh, why do you think there has been this increase in the number of hate crimes? And I'm talking now about the homegrown terrorism, talk about the hate crimes. So uh, when it comes to the subject of hate crimes, uh, we are seeing an increase in the reporting of hate crimes. We know, I think, fairly widely, I think, accepted in the law enforcement community that hate crimes are historically underreported. Whether the uptick in reporting is because of an uptick in hate crime occurrence or whether an uptick in agencies that now understand the importance of reporting it, it's a little bit hard to tell. Uh, we have been doing a lot at the FBI. We've done hundreds of seminars, workshops, trainings, et cetera, of state and local law enforcement around the country, community groups, et cetera, to try to raise awareness to increase the reporting. So okay. I think it's a positive sign on the one hand that there's more reporting. But it's Hard possible to say there's also that, more hate right. crimes, I yeah. see. Um, so like many of my colleagues on both sides of the aisle, we were very concerned and deeply disturbed by the president's tweets, uh, the chants at the rallies about the four uh, congresswomen. And um, I was particularly concerned because one of those congresswomen is in my state and she was particularly singled out. She had already uh, thanks to the good work of your agents and local law enforcement, someone who had made a serious threat against her in the past had been arrested and sent to jail. Um, and I'm not going to ask you if uh, these four women, or particularly Congressman Omar, has sought protection. I don't think that would be uh, appropriate. But could you tell me what type of assistance the FBI uh, offers members of Congress who are subject to these threats? Um, and what's the efforts underway to track these kinds of threats? Well, certainly anytime uh, someone, including a, a member of Congress, uh, is the subject uh, of, a, of a threat, uh, we hope that they will come forward. We want to try to communicate with them. Uh, if there's enough predication for an investigation, then we'll open an investigation. We will work with... Uh, security here up on the hill itself uh, sometimes to uh, try to see if we can be of assistance. As far as tracking goes, 
we have a variety of ways of, of tracking investigations. I don't know that I have something specific to, uh, at least sitting here right now, that's narrowly tailored to threats to members of Congress, but I, I'm sure we're keeping track of it in a variety of ways. Okay, um, just last on the subject of guns, I appreciate it and share um, um, your deep respect for those families and those officers that put themselves, made the uh, ultimate sacrifice. Um, but most of the examples involved guns. And Senator Cornyn asked a question about the background check system. Um, but there's so much more we could do, like closing the gun show loophole um, and here in Congress passing the bill that we had, the bipartisan bill um, to improve background checks. And then also, um, specifically, one of your examples was about domestic violence, a domestic violence report that an officer went to the scene and got killed. We had a similar one like this in Minnesota. And right now, in the um, Violence Against Women Act that passed the House with 33 Republican votes, uh, is a provision that I have long worked on uh, with Senator Hirono and others that closes the um, gun show loop, the, the boyfriend loophole. And if this is where in existing law right now, uh, if you live with someone or you're married to them and you've been convicted of domestic violence and you can't go out and get a gun, but half of those domestic homicides are involving boyfriends or sometimes girlfriends, and there's a loophole that says it doesn't apply if you're convicted uh, and you can't go out and get a gun if you've convicted of domestic violence against the boyfriend. Um, do you think it would be helpful to close that loophole? Uh, I haven't reviewed the particular legislation, and I would need to be able to take a look at it to give you a, a sense from an operational perspective. Okay. I just, um, there's, do you agree that there is more we could do besides just the questions from uh, Senator Cornyn when it comes to making the world safer for our law enforcement with regard to guns? Well, we're always looking for ways to enhance the NICS system uh, consistent with the law, and I think we clearly need, as I said at the beginning, to take a harder look at uh, violence against law enforcement in this country in a variety of ways. All right, thank you. Senator Cruz. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, Director Ray. Welcome, thank you for your service. Uh, let me start in particular by thanking you for your opening statement. Uh, it, it was a powerful testament to the men and women of law enforcement who serve on the front lines. Uh, like you, I have uh, spent far too much time with grieving families of the men and women in blue who have lost their lives protecting us, keeping us safe. Theirs is a difficult job. It is a job. Uh, I think we are all obliged to take the time to appreciate, to say thank you. Uh, and and I, appreci I appreciate, I encourage folks to listen to your opening statement because it was a powerful reminder that, that, that every single day an officer wakes up and puts on his or her unif uniform and straps on his or her gun and kisses his wife or her husband goodbye for the morning, they may not see their kids again. And, and thank you for the work the FBI is doing to keep our officers safe and the obligation all of us have to continue to keep officers safe. Um, I want to start with a topic that, that has been discussed some already this morning, uh, which is Chinese espionage. Uh, you have described uh, the threat of China as, as unique and, and the most significant that we are facing, and, and your testimony said that the United States significantly underestimates the threat of Chinese economic espionage. Uh, what avenues are we seeing where Chinese economic espionage is manifesting? So certainly it, it covers the waterfront in terms of uh, sectors from startups, high-tech companies, all the way to aerospace, to aviation, to agriculture. Uh, we had uh, you know, a case in Kansas not that long ago where they were attempting to steal uh, you know, highly proprietary rice seeds that were being developed. You know, the U.S. agriculture is the envy of the world, uh, and that's a place where they're done a number of things. So it covers the whole spectrum of types of sectors, but then in terms of size of businesses, it's mm -hmm. Fortune 100 companies all the way down to startups in Silicon Valley. And then in terms of types of techniques, it involves everything from cyber intrusions to corruption of insiders uh, to things that are not illegal but are still a national security threat, different kinds of foreign investment, uh, et cetera. So, there is a, it's kind of an all tools approach by them, uh, and it therefore requires an all tools approach by us. 
one sector in particular that I've been concerned about uh, is the academic se sector and, and our colleges and universities. I've met with quite a few colleges and universities, research institutions based in the state of Texas, uh, some of which have been victims of, of uh, attempted or, or completed Chinese espionage. Uh, and one concern that I have, particularly in the academic sector, is their leaders ten tend to be, in some instances, less aware of the scope of the threat and less sophisticated and savvy than some in, say, the Fortune 100 world uh, in terms of means of defending against espionage and, and theft of intellectual property. Uh, to what extent do you see Chinese espionage in the academic world as a problem, and, and what more should we be, we be doing about it? So I'm glad you raised it. I, I too, share your concerns in that space. Uh, we, there's a number of things that are going on there. One is that the uh, Chinese government and the Chinese Communist Party have a number of so-called talent plans. So, you know, you hear about the thousand talent plans. And there's nothing inherently unlawful about the talent plans themselves. However, however, we have seen through lots of investigations abuse of those talent plans. And essentially, we have situations where uh, we have, it's created a pipeline in some cases at major universities, especially at the graduate level, more so than at the undergraduate level, of uh, key intellectual property, sometimes that has dual use uh, potential, uh, flowing back to China for the advancement of its various strategic plans. And the irony is that the U.S is essentially funding that economic resurgence through various uh, uh, money that it provides to, you know, through grants, et cetera. So I think we do have to be a little bit careful that we don't find ourselves in a situation where essentially U.S. taxpayer money is being misappropriated for the advancement of China's achievement of economic dominance over us. Um, there are a lot of cases where those uh, plans become violations of U.S. law or at the very least violate uh, non-competes and things like that that might exist. And I think universities need to be uh, more and more aware of who it is they're inviting over and what safeguards they can put in place. And so one of the things the FBI is trying to do a lot of, and in fact, uh, we've had some very good work with uh, Texas A&M recently uh, to try to raise awareness in the uh, university space uh, so that, again, we're not requiring universities to do anything. That's not the FBI's role. What we're trying to do is raise awareness so that they can make thoughtful, voluntary decisions that are not just in the country's best interest, but I would argue in the best interest of their own academic research. So, so I agree with you, and I look forward to our continuing to work with you to, to, to both protect our universities, but also to ensure against espionage of intellectual property. Uh, let me turn to a final topic, which is an, an, an area of concern for me which is the group that has called itself Antifa, uh, which, which ironically is short for anti-fascism, and yet they engage in the conduct of fascists. They engage in violent protests, mac masked men and women engaging in physical violence. We saw recently the Rose City chapter of Antifa in Portland, Oregon, that was assaulting citizens, was disrupting traffic, violently assaulted one journalist so severely that he was hospitalized for brain hemorrhage. Likewise, this weekend, uh, a, a Mr. Willem van Sprossen, an, another Antifa terrorist, attacked a U.S. Immigration and Customs Enforcement Center in Tacoma, Washington, igniting a vehicle and attempting to ignite a propane tank. Uh, I am concerned that this is not, these are not isolated instance, instances, but rather this is a pattern, an organization that is engaged in massed, anonymous, violent terrorism. Uh, to what extent is the FBI concerned about the threat of violent activity uh, from an organization like Antifa? So uh, we are absolutely concerned about violence committed on behalf of any ideology, any extremism. Uh, uh, no and the key there, though, is the point that I think I made in response to a couple of different questions already, which is, again, the FBI doesn't investigate ideology. We investigate violent criminal activity. And if it's fueled by some ideology, then that's how it gets wrapped into our mandate. And so for us, Antifa, uh, we view as more of an ideology than a, an organization. We have quite a number, though, I should tell you, 
of properly predicated investigations of what we categorize as anarchist extremists, people who are trying to commit violent criminal activity that violates federal law, and some of those people do subscribe to what we would refer to as a kind of an Antifa-like ideology. We don't think of Antifa so much as an organization as such, but I think we're saying sort of the same thing. Although the Bureau has significant tools to go after organizations, criminal enterprises, that engage, that use anonymity, that use masks to carry out violence, groups like the Klan, groups like at times the Mafia, uh, and, and I will today be sending a letter to you and the Department of Justice asking the department to open a RICO investigation into Antifa because I believe they are engaged in a similar coordinated effort. Uh, that letter will likewise focus on some local elected officials who have chosen to deny police protection to their citizens based on political ideology. That is a pattern, sadly, that we saw, we have seen with politicians who favored Klan violence, and I think Every citizen deserves law enforcement protection, regardless of their political ideology. Well, I look forward to reviewing your letter. Thank you. Senator Coons. Thank you, Chairman Graham. Director Ray, good to see you again. Uh, on behalf of all of us, I just want to thank you and the 37,000 men and women of the FBI for what you do each and every day. Um, in my own community, the FBI continues to make a difference. Uh, in just the last few months in Delaware, that ongoing close partnership with state and local law enforcement you've referenced has produced uh, arrests and convictions in drug trafficking, fraud, bribery, cyber stalking. I think uh, we too easily forget the critical difference that the FBI partnership with state and local law enforcement uh, makes, and I greatly appreciate your opening remarks. Um, my own worst days in public service were attending line of duty death uh, funerals uh, for Officer Chad Spicer in Georgetown for um, Sergeant Joe Zerba in my own county police department, I'll never forget those. Those are um, really difficult and hard days, and I'm uh, grateful that you continue to remind us of that core part of law enforcement work, which is exposure to risk, and that we work together in ways to reduce that risk and to um, improve officer safety. Uh, one of the things that uh, my colleague Senator Cornyn uh, brought up to you was the ways in which the NICS background check system was improved um, after the Sutherland Springs shooting. Uh, by the passage of the Fix NICS bill, which just made sure that information gathered in one silo was shared across the whole system, because had that been done in a timely way, the shooter in Sutherland Springs would have been barred from getting uh, a weapon. We've talked in the past, uh, I think it was uh, last May, um, about a bill that I have with Senator Toomey um, that would share with state and local law enforcement NICS denials. There were, I think, 99,252 uh, Nick's denials last year, which means someone who is a person prohibited from getting a weapon went into a federally licensed uh, firearm dealer and was told you can't purchase. In some states, the state police conduct that initial transfer of information, Pennsylvania's one, so they immediately know about it and they can go uh, follow up and where appropriate um, arrest someone for lying and trying in my home state of Delaware and 31 other states, that's not the case. This is a simple bipartisan bill. It would simply require real-time sharing with one state law enforcement contact of any NICS denial. Um, since we spoke about it last May, I wondered if you'd had any more thoughts about it, whether this is something uh, you would support uh, as a simple way um, to put more information in the hands of our state and local law enforcement partners, and whether you'll work with me in my office uh, to try and get this through this committee. Well, Senator, I, uh, on the one hand, I have not had a chance to review uh, the proposed legislation itself, but I do very specifically recall our conversation on this topic uh, and how important it is to you. And I think there, there's sort of two principles at stake here that I think we're on the same place with. You know, one is the goal of keeping guns out of the hands of people legally prohibited from having them. And second, uh, consistent with my opening statement, right. the need to support state and local law enforcement right. in their efforts. Uh, as you say, last year, uh, NICS, I think, denied around 100,000 background checks, so the volume is significant. Uh, and my own sense is that what would be most helpful here is to have a conversation that brings in and makes sure that state and local law enforcement has the appropriate seats at the table, because I, I hear all the time when I'm out in the field with state and local law enforcement uh, the burden that they feel they're under. So I want to be a little bit careful before we just well, Director, dump all the information let's on them and move just kind to of that quickly if we can. Yeah. Our last conversation yeah. was months ago in response to Senator Cornyn's question. You said 
Fix Nick saves lives. Um, every chief of police I've met with or spoken to in Delaware says they would welcome this information. I think they would handle it promptly and thoroughly, and I think they would help promote public safety with that information. I have at least two other questions okay. in three minutes, so let me move. But I would welcome further engagement on this point. I think this is a common sense, simple way to enforce the laws on the books. Election interference, there's been a lot of uh, questioning, uh, which is constructive, I think, about China's intelligence efforts in the United States. Um, I also want to make sure we've talked through about Russia's election interference. I appreciate your clear statements that um, they exerted improper influence on our 2016 election. They haven't stopped trying. They're still coming. We haven't successfully deterred them. Uh, on the appropriations uh, subcommittee in which I serve, we put $380 million into strengthening election infrastructure two years ago, zero last year. Uh, it is my hope we will invest more in um, state and local election infrastructure, but you've created in the FBI the Foreign Influence Task Force. One of the things I'm concerned about is so-called deep fakes, uh, false, manipulated, misleading media clips that are very difficult for the average uh, viewer to discern. What steps is the FBI taking to address deep fakes, which in a number of briefings I hear is one of the most likely next order threats in the 2020 election? Well, certainly uh, we share uh, the concern about deep fakes as a potential tool, uh, not just frankly in the malign foreign influence space that you've referenced, but any number of other contexts. Uh, one of the things that I did not that long ago uh, was bring together all of our top executives uh, for a presentation and then a discussion led by our Office of Technology Division, which has the best expertise from a technological perspective on this. I think the real challenge of deep fakes is that without the right kind of training, it's very hard for somebody to be able to distinguish uh, and to be able to unpack what's a deep fake versus not. We are uh, looking at different technologies that we might be able to have to help um, unravel that. So there's a, maybe some technological solutions we're also trying to look at ways to partner with the private sector on it because there's a role where I think that they can play. Uh, so I don't think I have anything specific to report here, but I can assure you that this is a subject that uh, has the concern of really everybody at the top of the FBI. Well, I appreciate your clear voice on the ongoing efforts by Russia to interfere in our election. I hope uh, we'll have the benefit of a similarly clear voice about the risks of deep fakes. Uh, last question for you, if I could. Um, I spent Friday in McAllen, Texas with a number of my colleagues. Many colleagues of both parties have visited the border recently. Um, it became clear to me in the conversations I had with a few dozen migrants that they were all from Central America, had all fled um, significant violence and uh, lack of order. And this is in El Salvador and Guatemala and Honduras. Um, there is a program of the FBI, um, the Legal Attaché uh, Program, um, that has made a real difference, uh, and I appreciated your highlighting that in your prepared remarks. Tell me more, if you would, about how the FBI legates and uh, programs like the Transnational Anti-Gang Task Force um, are making a difference in confronting gang violence in the Northern Triangle and thus changing some of the circumstances that drive families to make the very difficult decision to risk a more than 1,000-mile uh, journey to our southern border, because I, I frankly think it's in all of our interest to use our skills, strengths, and abilities like the FBI to change the conditions in Central America to change the outcome on our southern border? Well, certainly, Senator, uh, we agree with you that our efforts through what we call the TAG units uh, in Central America are one of the ways in which we at the FBI can do our part to help contribute to border security, but also just more generally the safety of Americans here inside the United States. Uh, the TAG units essentially provide a way for us down in El Salvador and in a couple of the other Northern Triangle countries to um, act, use the local law enforcement as a force multiplier. So we provide some of our expertise, some of our uh, experience, some of our partnership, uh, and then working with a larger group of local law enforcement uh, it helps them learn while doing, but it also helps them be more effective in tackling uh, a very serious criminal problem down there. I've met with uh, officials from uh, that part of the world uh, as they've come to visit me uh, in the U.S., and something we're very proud of, and we think we want to double down on if we can. Are you requesting additional funding for that program this year? Have you had any difficulty in terms of the continuity of effort? 
Uh, I think we're we're humming along. Uh, we had some some scares, but I think we're 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 moving forward. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I have questions for the record. I'll send you about uh, facial recognition technology and it's uh, your work with state DMV databases. And um, I just will add uh, to what Senator Whitehouse raised in terms of concerns about how background checks are done, and look forward to talking with you about that further. Thank you for your testimony today, Senator Dress. Welcome. When you uh, came to my office. I discuss with you, like I do every person that comes to my office for nomination confirmation, one, to bring up about whistleblowers and respect for whistleblowing, and number two, we answer all of our letters. And I usually advise people in the last uh, five years, instead of saying yes, they ought to say maybe. So I don't know whether you said yes or maybe, but it turns out maybe. So for example, uh, some of my oversight requests, uh, some dating back over a year. February 2018, I inquired into the terrible tragedy at Parkland, Florida. 17 lives were lost. March 2018, I chaired a hearing on that shooting. Uh, the FBI told the Judiciary Committee that it was working on a report on internal process failures relating to, among other things, the intake procedure for call-in tips and what transpired in the Parkland case. As of today, the FBI hasn't provided a report to Congress. Is the report complete? I don't know that I can speak to the report itself, but I can tell you, Senator, that we have- I'm not asking you to speak to the report. Is, oh, okay. the, is the report complete? And I, as I sit here right now, I don't know whether the report you're referring to is complete. What I do know is that we have completed a significant uh, investigation, if you will, internal investigation of what happened out there and made a, a whole number of changes. I'd be happy to provide more information okay. about what's, what's happened out well, let's there. Let's say you don't know whether the co report's complete. You've given us an update on it. I appreciate that. Let me ask you this. When the report is completed, will Congress get it? I'd be happy to see what information we can provide about the work we've done. I'm not trying to play word games with you here. I just don't know enough about the specific report that you're referring to, no. the document. Oh, you, you but I, I do know that we would be happy to provide detailed information to you and any other member of Congress well, about the hard work that's been done to improve it, our public access. Except line. for national security or except for privacy, what couldn't be made public about what the FBI did right or wrong? I think we'd be happy to provide you more information about it. Okay. On uh, May the 9th, Senator Johnson and I wrote you a letter about documents that the State Department provided the FBI after it met with Christopher Steele. When can Senator Johnson and I expect a response? Uh, that one I'm going to have to ask my staff to look in and we'll get back to you. Okay. According to news reports, the FBI waited months before pursuing sexual abuse allegations made by Olympic gymnasts. Last July, Senator Feinstein, Blumenthal, and I sent you a letter to request a briefing on the matter. We're still waiting. When can we expect a response to our letter and a briefing? Uh, well, Senator, on that particular matter, we, uh, as you may know, there is an ongoing Inspector General investigation. So we essentially turned that matter over from our inspection division to Inspector General Horowitz uh, and his team. And so we are awaiting uh, the results of that investigation uh, and would be happy to uh, engage with, uh, with you and your office upon completion of the Inspector General's investigation. Well, is he supposed to report to you or to the public? Uh, probably both, I would assume. Okay. I've sent several letters to the FBI regarding the investigation into the shooting of Bijan Geyser by the National Park Police. I haven't received a substantive response. When can I expect clear answers to my questions and a conclusion of that investigation, which I think now is 18 months old? Well, I'm not intimately familiar with the investigation, but I believe it is still ongoing, so it would be premature for us to provide any substantive information at this point. You know, you kind of get the feeling with several of these instances that there might be something out there that's going to embarrass the FBI. Are you worried about embarrassing the FBI? 
Uh, if some of this stuff's made public? Uh, I am not having us withhold any information out of fear of embarrassment to the FBI. Okay. Uh, we take our share of lumps, uh, and uh, I embrace that as part of the process. The FBI has made its share of mistakes uh, over the years, and, and you've, I think, played an important role in some cases in highlighting some of those mistakes. And I think one of the things that distinguishes the FBI from a lot of other organizations is our commitment to learning from those mistakes. I wrote you a letter in April concerning the case of Special Agent Parkinson. He made protected disclosures and was dismissed. But after he won his case against the Bureau and was reinstated, his security clearance was revoked. I haven't received a response. Does the FBI revoke security clearances as a way of getting around court decisions favorable to a, an employees? And then can I get a response to my letter? I'm not familiar with this specific matter, so let me ask my staff more about it and we'll get back to you on that one. Okay. Um, as I've written about publicly before, the Justice Department Inspector General produced Congress a highly classified document relating to Clinton investigation. Here is an excerpt from the Inspector General's unclassified report on the Clinton investigation related to the classified report. Quote, although the mid-year team drafted a memorandum to Deputy Attorney General in late May 2016 stating that review of a highly classified materials was necessary to complete the investigation and requesting permission to access them, the FBI never sent this request to the department. So this tells us four things. One, the FBI apparently had highly classified information potentially irrelevant to the Clinton investigation in its possession. The FBI drafted a memo in May 2016 to get access to the information. The memo said the review of the information was necessary to complete the investigation. The memo was never sent. Question, Director Ray, how could the FBI complete the Clinton investigation if it didn't review all the potential relatively information related to it? And lastly, do you know of any other examples where the investigation was completed without the FBI reviewing potentially relevant evidence within its possession? Well, Senator, as to the specific example uh, you cited, I'm generally familiar with the fact pattern. I am a little bit concerned. Uh, I recognize that you're reading from an unclassified document, but I'm a little bit concerned that my ability to address it in this setting is somewhat limited. So let me circle back with my staff and figure out if there's a way for us to be a little more responsive in a different kind of setting. Well, I'll be waiting for that information. Thank you very much. Senator Blumenthal. Thanks, Mr. Chairman. Thank you for being here today, Director Ray, and thank you for Oh, dear. Your service to our country and the men and women who every day courageously God bless you. go after threats against our nation. And uh, I want to say that I regret some of the attacks that have come from the highest levels of our government. And I respect that you have to continue to work without responding to them directly. but. I think you have a lot of supporters and friends in this body and around the country. Uh, I want to ask you uh, about threats identified by members of Congress. I appreciate the FBI's responsiveness to them. Uh, I'm concerned that these threats are increasing and that they've been condoned and indeed encouraged by the President of the United States. I'd like to know what is being done proactively not just responsibly, but proactively to protect members who have been targeted by the president's attacks, which may ignite white supremacists and nationalist organizations. Well, obviously I can't discuss any particular investigation, uh, but I don't take you to be asking me for that. I would say that we have a very good relationship, good partnership, with uh, the security professionals up here on the Hill, uh, and we try to work collaboratively with them, especially through our Washington field office, 
to try to make sure that we're giving them the right kind of information so that they can be even more effective in helping protect you and your colleagues. Are you concerned, as I am and others are, about the increasing number and intensity of those attack, threatened attacks? Well, I, I think we're very concerned about any threats of violence against any Americans, but certainly that would prominently include our elected officials. And are you concerned that the president's rhetoric, in fact, is having a negative impact not only on those threats, but on other Americans in terms of encouraging hate crime? You know, Senator, I don't, I don't really engage on rhetoric uh, or social media commentary. Um, but words our focus is on no. our focus is on violence on attempts to commit violence, on conspiracies to commit violence, uh, and we will aggressively pursue that, with whether the victims are members of Congress or any other Americans. Uh, let me turn to another area, uh, and I know you're well informed about it. Uh, survivors of the 9-11 terrorist attacks on this country are engaged in an epic legal battle against the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia for its complicity, and there is mounting credible evidence that it aided and abetted the 9-11 attackers, seeking justice from them. In fact, uh, along with Senator Schumer and Senator Cornyn, I was proud to lead the Justice Against Sponsors of Terrorism Act that opened the courthouse doors to their lawsuits. Uh, I was proud also to work with Senator Cornyn on a resolution passed unanimously by the United States Senate that called on the federal government to declassify documents related to the 9-11 attacks, quote, to the greatest extent possible. Those 9-11 families are fighting the government of Saudi Arabia seeking justice. They are now also fighting our own government, including your agency, to secure FBI documents that they believe are relevant to their litigation and to finally determining the role that Saudi Arabia played in those 9-11 attacks. Two of uh, those survivors and family members are with us today in the hearing room, Brett Eagleson and Tom Froelich. Brett lost his dad. Bruce, who was last seen climbing the stairs of the South Tower, seeking to help his colleagues. He perished. And Mr. Froelich made it out of the South Tower on that terrible day, but he continues to suffer the mental and physical costs of that experience. And he continues to mourn, as we all do, the ones who were lost. So. I'm asking you uh, for a commitment that the FBI will release all of the documents that are relevant to this litigation, that you will not invoke the State Secrets Act, which has been raised as a possibility, and that you will provide full transparency to those families who are simply seeking justice against Saudi Arabia in the face of very significant mounting evidence, powerful evidence, that the Saudis aided and abetted that crime that killed thousands of Americans? Well, Senator, I'm not going to engage on the specific litigation, uh, certainly here in this setting. Uh, what I will say on a very personal level uh, is that I was in FBI headquarters on 9-11, uh, I met during my time as Assistant Attorney General with many, 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 many of the victims of the 9-11 attacks, and it was a big part of my motivation for coming back into service. And one of the things that I've done since becoming FBI Director, uh, mindful of the fact that as time passes, we get further and further away from those attacks, and our workforce ages out of the kind of acute real-time appreciation of the horror that occurred on that morning. Uh, we have, I have directed that all new agents and analysts of the FBI go as part of their training to the 9-11 Memorial and Museum 
so that they can see in particular uh, the victim impact of our work and of getting it right. And I'm very sympathetic, and I say that just from a personal level so you know that I'm extremely sympathetic to those families. I am also extremely sympathetic to all the families of future potential terrorist threats that I want to prevent. And I, I want to make sure I, that our I, I handling of secret information is done in a way that balances both of those concerns. I, I uh, don't doubt your sympathy, but these documents are absolutely necessary to their having a fair chance to prove their case. And uh, I'm concerned uh, that the FBI may invoke the state secrets privilege to block the 9-11 families from getting <coughs> the documents that they need. And I'm asking you for your commitment that you will not invoke it or block them from getting those documents. <coughs> And as I said, I, I'm not prepared to make commitments about ongoing litigation or discovery and ongoing litigation here in this setting. I can assure you that we will try to be as transparent as I think we can responsibly be while at the same time protecting national security. Will you meet with the families who are represented here today? I would be happy to see whether there's an appropriate meeting that can occur, occur between them and parts of the FBI. But again, since this is a subject of litigation, I think we have to be thoughtful about that. Have you communicated with the White House about this issue of whether documents will be turned over to the families? Not to my knowledge. Uh, will you uh, give me a, a list of those documents that you think would be appropriate to turn over and the others that would not be? I'd be happy to take a harder look at what the status of that litigation is and whether there is information that we can responsibly provide to be helpful. But and that's I'm about all I can say right to, now. And my final question, uh, I'm not asking you to be involved in the litigation or comment on the litigation, but simply to provide documents and materials that are in the possession of the FBI. The only reason to keep them secret seems to me at this late date, 19 years later, would be to avoid embarrassment to the Saudis. And that may be an interest of the State Department or the White House. They have shown very little interest in seeking justice in connection with other Saudi criminal activity, witness the Khashoggi murder, as an example of the President's willingness to ignore the law and logic, but I think the FBI has an interest in justice. Would you agree? I, I certainly agree the FBI has a powerful interest in justice. I also think that uh, you, especially with your background, will, will appreciate why I, I'm not going to be making commitments about document production in, in this kind of setting. Well, I appreciate it, certainly as a former U.S. attorney and a former Attorney General, having worked closely with the FBI, but I hope we can continue this conversation. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you for sending the new agents to the 9-11 memorial. We should all probably go. And I've written a letter to Senator Schumer and McConnell to give a classified briefing about what's going on in Afghanistan. Everybody needs to understand what's happening in Afghanistan. Senator Kennedy. Uh, Mr. Director, you talked earlier about there being no daylight between the Communist Party in China and the government in China and the business community. Does that include uh, Chinese students in foreign countries? In, involves, it certainly includes some Chinese students, uh, not, not all by any stretch of the imagination, but some. I, I need your help in understanding how we're, we're making the distinction. As we know, um, we, have a lot, we have a lot of foreign students that come to our fine universities, and our fine universities love them because they pay, they pay full freight, they pay full tuition. In fact, some of our universities, I think, are addicted financially to them. Um, when, a, when a foreign student, let's just take, say, for example, China, uh, comes to MIT, MIT let's say, um, and, and works in a lab there on 
new technology that is being developed? Are we relying on the universities to, to uh, determine whether the students are stealing intellectual property? Well, I would say the university certainly plays an important role. Uh, there may be situations where we, through our investigative work, uh, learn that somebody's trying to steal an extra well, property. So then we, we both play a role. It is a partnership Here's there. what I'm getting to. Uh, we have thousands of students coming to our American universities. Many of them are in research labs. Many of them are, are privy to sensitive intellectual property. H how do we check them? Whose job is it to check them? You can't check. The FBI can't check every single student that comes to the United States. If we're relying on a, on a university to do it, um, my guess is a lot of them don't know how. And frankly, some of them probably don't care as long as they're getting the tuition. Well, I, I think you're on to the right point, right, which is there is a role for the universities to play, but we need to make sure that we're supplying them with, you said whether they know and whether they care, whether they have both the, uh, the tools that we can give them to ask the right questions, to elicit the right information uh, on the one hand, but also to be thoughtful about what of their information is most yeah. proprietary, most sensitive. There might be a difference, for example, between uh, a student who comes in to do basic undergraduate work. Of course. And a student on the other extreme who's working on some of the most sensitive technological research this country of has. Of course. Uh, so there's, and then as far as the should they care part of it, one of the things the FBI is spending a lot of time doing uh, is out on the ground engaging with universities, research labs, et cetera, to try to help them understand the nature of the threat, what to be on the lookout for, et cetera. So there's a, a common defense quality to this. Well, should we not have a rule, uh, Mr. Director, that says, look, if you're from another country, not just China, but other countries. And you're coming to this university to be involved with this research, then the university has to apply for and receive a, a deemed export license. And, and don't tell me that, that the student is just observing. Um, we're gonna be cautious here and say, university, go get a deemed export license. Well, I, I, I'm not an expert on deemed export licenses. Uh, I think there may be roles for uh, rule changes, et cetera, that might help us collectively uh, better protect the country and our most sensitive information. I don't think our universities are doing it. I think, they, I think some are, and some are doing a good job. But I think others say, oh, it's not my responsibility. And by the way, their tuition check ca uh, cashed. I, you know, I, I, I see exactly where you're coming from. I guess what I would say is my experience now and having gone out and about around the country and met with all 56 field offices as well as with partners, including in the academic sector in an awful lot of those states, is that uh, there are a growing number of universities uh, which are much smarter now about this issue than they used sure. to be. Not necessarily where they, we need they, to they be. They are, and, and of course the cow is out the barn in many respects. Um, the universities weren't shy about inviting Confucius <laughs> Institutes to their campuses. They were glad to have the money. I, I mean, Australia has the same problem. Many Australian universities are addicted to, to uh, tuition from Chinese students. I'm not criticizing Australia. Wonderful ally, great country. God bless them. But, but this has become a serious problem, and I sense you're spread thin. I sense that we're relying on our universities, and it's great to educate them, but, but as long as those tuition checks clear, some of them aren't going to really participate. And I think, I, I think we, what we need is some sort of, of rule that in these particular technologies, um, you got to go get a, you university have to go get a deemed export license. Let me shift gears. Um, is the FBI involved in the uh, the investigation in Chicago of the uh, Jesse Smollett 
police complaint? I'm not sure there's anything I can say uh, about whether we're involved in a specific investigation or not. Okay, that's fair. You, you, I consider you, first, I, I, I consider you uh, to be doing a great job. I think you've settled the waters, Chris, Thank and you. I really appreciate it. Thank you. Um, and I don't think you're a politician. That's what I like about you. Uh, I think you're a good lawyer, and you care about the FBI, and I consider you the nation's chief law enforcement official, if not one of the chiefs. I don't mean to denigrate the Attorney General. He's up there, too. Why do so many Americans today, in your judgment, hate cops just because they're cops? You know, I think there's some level of misunderstanding about what law enforcement does and doesn't do, uh, and that's probably part of it. But I also think far more Americans revere law enforcement than sometimes the media would otherwise suggest. Uh, and that's one of the advantages I've found uh, to getting out of Washington and trying to visit all 56 field offices and to visit not only the men and women of state and local law enforcement in each of those states, but also to meet with people in the community from each of those states, because that's a better way for me to get a sense of how people think about law enforcement. Um, so I don't think most people hate law enforcement. Uh, I think most people are grateful for law enforcement, but the reality is that there are, is a level of violence that, occurring, that is occurring in this country and, and a willingness to use lethality against law enforcement that I think we just cannot abide, and we need to be finding ways to make those people who work so hard every day more safe. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. The vote is on, and we'll continue, and uh, we're just going to keep going and try to get you out of here by 1 o'clock if we possibly can. Uh, are you okay to keep going? Senator Hirano. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. You know that, uh, uh, that rookie agents visit 9-11 Memorial, and there was a time when uh, part of the training for incoming FBI agents was to visit the Holocaust Museum. Do you still do that? Uh, not only do, I, uh, do we still do the, uh, the visits to the Holocaust Museum as part of our training, uh, but I have personally gone I wanted to go through it myself. Not only did I reaffirm it, but I actually went with a class and spoke to the class and went along the tour so that I could get a sense of what they're learning as they go through that. We also require, you may be interested to know, uh, the third leg of the stool, if you will. You got the Holocaust Memorial, the 9-11 Memorial Museum, which I added. We also have all agents go to the Martin Luther King Memorial here in DC. Uh, your predecessor, uh, uh, Director Comey, had made note of the importance, as far as he was concerned, of uh, the experience of visiting the Holocaust Museum. And I don't know if you've uh, heard what he said. Uh, let me just quote him. To see that although the slaughter, the Holocaust, was led by sick and evil people, those sick and evil leaders were joined by and followed by people who loved their families, took soup to a sick neighbor, and went to church and gave to charity. Good people help murder millions, and that's the most frightening lesson of all, that our very humanity made us capable of, even susceptible to, surrendering our individual moral authority to the group where it can be hijacked by evil, of being so cowed by those in power, of convincing ourselves of nearly anything. I'm really glad that um, the, your agents visit these museums, and I, I, I wonder if you agree with uh, your predecessor's comments about why it's so important for your agents to experience these museums? Well, I'm I, uh, not sure I caught everything that you read from the quote. I will say that from my own perspective, one of the things I found most eye-opening about my own visit with a class going to the Holocaust Memorial was the uh, really scary role that law enforcement mm -hmm. in Nazi Germany played. Uh, I think most people, I as a kid growing up in this country, assumed that most of the atrocities were just committed by, you know, the military in Nazi Germany. And while that is certainly true, there was also a, uh, a very frightening role that law enforcement in Nazi Germany played too. And I think that's yes. one of the parts of the tour that uh, is a little bit tailored for our classes so that they understand in a very personal way that their profession is one that if they don't do things in the right way, 
can can have horrific consequences. That they, they have a personal responsibility also. Uh, have you read the Mueller report? Uh, I've, I've reviewed it. I wouldn't say I've read every single word. Uh, do you consider Mr. Mueller to be a person of integrity, objectivity, and professionalism in your experience with him? In all my experiences with him over the years, I've considered him to be uh, the consummate professional and a straight shooter. So do you have any reason to doubt his report, the Mueller report, the findings, and the, 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 basically how he went about the investigation of the Russia interference with our elections? Do you have any reason to doubt the integrity of his work? No. Okay. So um, in your written testimony, you mentioned the uh, threat of domestic violent extremists as one of your priorities. Uh, you talked about, quoting you, underlying drives for domestic violent extre extremism, which includes, according to you, racism, anti-Semitism, Isla Islamophobia. So can racist and divisive comments from national leaders contribute to the problem of domestic violent extremism? Uh, my sense is there's all kinds of things that contribute to the uh, often sort of deranged extremism that occurs. Yes, uh, you never know country. what's going to set off a lone wolf, but uh, would you say that comments from national leaders that are very racist and divisive can also uh, create a, uh, a, a situation where a lone wolf might act? I think uh, extremist rhetoric by anybody can have the effect, any public figure can yes. have the effect of, of inspiring people. But remember that the people who commit hate-fueled violence are not logical, rational people. Uh, uh, no, that's why it's very dangerous, I would say, for national leaders to speak in a way that can encourage or in some way incentivize a person who is unhinged. Let me turn to uh, the 37% uh, agency that you run. And you do have strict HR policies based on standards laid out by the Equal Employment Opportunity Com Commission. If one employee at the FBI told another empl employee who was a minority or an immigrant to go back where they came from, what would the consequences be knowing full well that the U.S. Equal Employment Opportunity Commission has made it very clear that uh, such uh, comments should, should subject a person to uh, some kind of disciplinary action? Well, I, I'm not going to engage in hypotheticals, but what I will tell you uh, is that all of us at the FBI are committed to core values of respect, of fairness, of diversity. We have all manner of procedures and policies that are in place to provide outlets for people who are the victims uh, of any kind of improper uh, discrimination or harassment. Uh, and we are firmly committed to our core mission uh, of protecting the American people, all American people, and protecting and upholding the Constitution so for all Americans. So that being the case, if one of your employees told another employee, go back where you came from, that would subject that employee to some kind of a disciplinary action? I, again, I'm not, I'm not going to engage in hypotheticals. I expect all of our employees to comport with our core values and to follow our rules and law. Uh, let, let's hope that that means that you actually follow through with some uh, disciplinary action. So in, in 2017, the Trump administration launched the Voice Office, which stands for Victims of Immigration Crime Engagement. It's an office dedicated to the victims of crimes committed by undocumented immigrants. And this despite repeated evidence that show that immigrants are in fact less likely to commit crimes. Does the FBI have a mechanism for tracking crimes committed against individuals because they are an immigrant or perceived to be an immigrant? I don't believe I've seen information quite like that, uh, but we collect lots of different kinds of information, so I'm, I'm reluctant to speak with, uh, with uh, absolute certainty on that. So I, I don't know exactly where the voice office is located. Uh, I take it not in the FBI. Uh, no, not in the FBI. Um, we have concerns about the independence of the FBI, so I wanted to ask you, has the president or anyone at the White House or the Attorney General or anyone at the Department of Justice asked or suggested that you do anything unlawful or unethical, including opening, altering, or closing an investigation? Uh, as I, I said to you and your colleagues on the committee during my confirmation hearing, I am committed to making sure that the FBI does all of its work by the book utterly without uh, partisan motivation oh. or interference, uh, and that has been true since the day I started, and it's been true right on up until today. So are you testifying that the, the President nor in, anyone at the White House or the Attorney General has not 
um, ask you to open, alter, or close an investigation? I can't think of a situation where any of those people has asked me to close an investigation or to do anything remotely inappropriate. That would be including altering and opening an investigation, I assume. So you're very cognizant and, and committed to the, the uh, independence of the FBI and the work that you do. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Senator Hawley. Director Ray, earlier this year, I sent the FBI two letters seeking additional information about news reports that the agency, the Bureau, had opened a counterintelligence investigation of the President following the exercise of the President's constitutional prerogatives to direct foreign policy and otherwise uh, oversee the executive branch. I did not receive a response to those letters beyond a form letter acknowledging receipts. And since I have you here and I have you under oath, let me just ask you what I want to know. To your knowledge, has the FBI ever launched a counterintelligence investigation of another president in American history? I don't know the answer to that question. So that it would, it would be no then, since it's to your knowledge. Is that right? It's fair to say you're not aware of one, personally. That's all I'm asking. It's fair to say that I'm not aware of one. Uh, is it safe then to say that, uh, to your, to the best of your knowledge, that such a move would be and is unprecedented? Uh, well, again, I don't, I don't. We've been around for 111 years, uh, so I don't really know what is precedent or not precedent in that regard. But you don't have any knowledge of any previous invest counterintelligence investigation of a sitting president being Not watched. sitting here at this moment. Would it be unusual for FBI agents to hide the existence and results of an investigation from their superiors? Certainly, in my experience, for agents to hide information from their superiors would be unusual. What, uh, what can you tell us finally about the internal investigation into the decision to launch this counterintelligence probe, where it stands, when we might hear about it, and when we might expect results? So there are two things going on. Uh, one is the uh, ongoing, uh, fairly far along, I, would, uh, I guess I would say, uh, investigation by the Inspector General, uh, which is somewhat related to the topic you raised. Uh, that's by the independent Inspector General over the Justice Department. And then separately, uh, as I think has been testified to publicly, the Attorney General uh, has uh, asked some questions about uh, the manner in which the investigation in question began. Uh, and we are working with him uh, or cooperating with him to try to help him get those questions answered. Uh, but I don't think I have any kind of status update or anything like that at this point. It's very much underway. So you're, you're aware then, just to make sure I understand your testimony, you're, you're aware of two different probes, if you will, two different uh, investigations or inquiries underway that touch on this topic that we've just been discussing. Right. They, there's some overlap between them, probably, uh, and they both, in their own ways, touch on different aspects of what you uh, described. Um, and, and your office and the FBI as a whole is fully cooperating with, with both inquiries, is that accurate? Yes. Um, let me shift gears and talk to you a little bit about China, Chinese espionage that other of my colleagues have asked about. And I want to ask you more specifically about Confucius Institutes, which you touched on just briefly with Senator Kennedy a moment ago. 18 months ago, when you were before the Senate Intelligence Committee, you said you were concerned about Chinese espionage at universities. It's a quote from you. The use of, you're concerned about the use of non-traditional collectors, especially in the academic setting, whether it's professors, scientists, students. You say you see it in almost every field office that the FBI has around the country, and you went on to say the Chinese are exploiting the very open research and development environment that we have, and you've reiterated those concerns here this morning. Um, do you continue to consider Chinese espionage uh, activities focused on research and IP theft to be a serious threat? I mean, you see that as continuing to be an ongoing threat? Uh, very much so. I think an awful lot of the most sensitive research uh, that is conducted across either military or dual use technologies, but also in areas like healthcare and things like that are conducted in our leading uh, academic institutions. And there is a fairly significant pattern of espionage that is occurring in that arena. So that's something we are concerned about. Well, let, me, let me just ask you now about specifically about Confucius uh, Institutes and why you've expressed concern about them and, and why you answered Senator Kennedy as you did. Why should we be concerned? Why should the American public, why should, for that matter, American university college presidents be concerned about Confucius Institutes on their campuses? Can you just sort of spell that out sure. for us? So, uh, 
my answer that I just gave was more broadly about the academic sector. The, the Confucius Institutes are a source of concern, but we view those more as part of China's soft power strategy and influence. Uh, in other words, those offer a platform to disseminate uh, Chinese government or Chinese Communist Party propaganda to encourage censorship, to restrict academic freedom, et cetera. So it is an area of concern, uh, and we are actually encouraged somewhat similar to the answer I was giving to Senator Kennedy by the growing number of universities in this country over the last few years that have taken steps to restrict and curtail uh, Confucius Institutes on their campuses. I will say we're even more concerned though about the what I would consider more traditional efforts uh, at either cyber intrusion or espionage both in the research facilities themselves uh, and in the private sector as I've testified about a little bit here today. It, just on the Confucius Institutes again for, for one minute, what would you say to a university president who's considering uh, partnering and allowing with the Confucius Institute and allowing an institute uh, on her campus? I mean, what, what would you, what considerations do you think that university president ought to have in mind? I would think uh, a university president ought to do an awful lot of homework and we'd be happy to have the local field office uh, sit down with them uh, to talk to them about uh, what we know that can be shared about Confucius Institutes so that they can make a thoughtful decision themselves about whether it's something they really want to have on their campus. Um, on the, uh, the more, to use your phrase, more traditional forms of espionage that the Chinese government and military is employing, do you think that, uh, do you think it's time for new legislation to help secure and protect our universities from that kind of espionage? Are there tools that we could give you that you think would be beneficial? Well, I don't know that I have specific legislative proposal, but I, I do think uh, that the level of awareness that is starting to increase in this country, including in the academic sector, and of course, uh, you and your colleagues have played an important role in helping raise awareness, I think is positive, and I think it's time for a national conversation about how we can all play our respective roles in helping to protect the country. I've introduced uh, legislation that would require uh, students, graduate students, or researchers from China and several other countries that we know engage in espionage activity uh, to get a, an additional screening by the Department of Homeland Security if they are applying to work on uh, a research project um, that involves uh, either classified information or high security, high risk security information as, as designated by the department. Now I'm not asking you to endorse that, but is, is that kind of, are those kinds of additional screenings, background checks for uh, folks who come from countries who have a history of espionage and who want to work on projects that are sensitive or classified, is that the kind of thing that you think we should be concerned about looking for ways to protect? Well, as you say, I haven't reviewed the, the specific legislation, but I, I think as a general rule, uh, both making sure that universities, espe uh, especially some of our uh, universities that are leaders in science and technology, uh, are really know who it is they're bringing in, so that's the who on the one hand, and then on the what on the other side, what information are they actually giving those people the ability to work on? They're, you know, not all information and research is created alike, just like not all uh, visitors are created alike in terms of the potential threat that it presents to our national security. Thank you. Uh, Senator Graham has asked me to keep it somewhat on time. I don't mean to cut off my friend, but uh, uh, because there are votes going on. Director, good to see you here. I noticed in your testimony you said you visited all our states. Did you visit Vermont or did you visit the Albany Station? I visited all 56 field offices, uh, and then when I was in the uh, Albany field office, which as you know, uh, has uh, Vermont as part of its AOR, I met with a, quite a number I've of- I've been to New York before. I yes, so, no, well, went there. but the, I met with a number of the uh, law enforcement uh, officials from Vermont, Come specifically Vermont who came from- sometime, yeah. and uh, I'm sure they'd like to see you. Um, I know I would. We know from unsealed search warrants of the Michael Cohen investigation that President Trump is an unindicted co-conspirator in a criminal campaign finance scheme to cover up an affair with hush money payment. Crime occurred both during the campaign and while Mr. Trump was in the Oval Office as he signed hush money checks while he was serving as president. But 
the investigation ended abruptly last week. Only Michael Cohen faced any consequences. So my question is, it's not clear from it what was in the press that this investigation ran its full course. Certainly no one interviewed the president. Do you know whether the decision to close the investigation was made by prosecutors in the Southern District of New York or by appointees of Maine Justice in Washington? Well, uh, the decision to uh, to decline a matter involving prosecutorial discretion is, of course, made by the prosecutors. In this instance, I don't know exactly who made the decision. You don't know whether it's in Washington or New York. I, I don't know which prosecutors were involved in making the decision. But what, you, do you know whether they were in Washington or New York? I don't know the answer to that. Thank you. So, have you been? Are you aware of any political pressure that may have been? brought to uh, bring about that decision in the Southern District. I'm not aware of any political pressure. Okay. Now, we know the Justice Department believes a sitting president cannot be charged with a crime. And that leads, for the time being, such matters to Congress and the public. Now, since this investigation is now closed, as we just talked about, will you release the 302s and other relevant files in the hush money investigation? Well, Senator, it is not normally our practice to uh, produce investigative information for investigations that are closed, uh, especially when it comes to other uh, individuals in the matter. Um, I think that's part of the protection that we provide uh, through the confidentiality of the work we do. That's interesting because on that confidentiality, you provided Congress with 880,000 pages of investigative documents relating to the Clinton email investigation. That also included 46 interview 302s uh, provided to Senator Grassley my, and myself as chairman and ranking member of the committee. And while you served as director, the FBI gave Congress thousands of pages related to surveillance activity of Russia. Russian contacts with the Trump campaign, that investigation was still ongoing. I'm not suggesting that this administration would treat the investigation of Hillary Clinton differently than the investigation involving Donald Trump, but I, it might appear that way. Uh, because if you don't release these files now, it's contrary to your recent precedent. Is it the case that? The FBI only provides investigative records when the request is made by Republican officials. Well, the Senator. I think of the 880,000 pages in the 46 interview 302s. It is certainly the case that in my first two years almost uh, as FBI director, uh, we have uh, been engaged with numerous committees and countless oversight requests involving all sorts of things. We try very hard to be as transparent as we can be with congressional oversight while, while at the same time protecting ongoing investigations, protecting confidentiality, uh, respecting the privacy of uncharged individuals, protecting sources and methods, respecting grand jury secrecy, and there's a whole slew of things that we try to balance. My experience is we try to work through each one on a case-by-case -case basis. With the I talked about is now closed. So will you release the 302s and the other relevant files in that hush money investigation the same way you did on the Clinton investigation? I'd be happy to take a look at any request from, from you or any other member of the Hill and see if there's more information we can provide. Consider that a request. Okay. And let's you and I talk about the next few days because I don't want it to be just a run along. And I have spent a few years here, so I know answers that are brush offs and answers that are real. I want that a real answer. I'd be happy to have my staff follow up with yours. Thank you. Earlier this year, as reported, the NSA has stopped using the call detail records authority authorized by USA Freedom and is not asking to be reauthorized. You mentioned this morning the FBI would like Congress to reauthorize the business records, roving wiretap and lone wolf provisions in the USA Freedom, which expire on December 15. Uh, yet we have not heard anything from the White House on their position regarding reauthorization. 
The only reason I mention it is we're only five months away from these thirties expiring. That could be a lifetime in the Senate. <laughs> There's been radio silence from the White House. Do you know when they plan or if they plan to finally share their position on reauthorization with Congress? Um, I, I'm not aware of a, uh, of a formal administration position on the USA Freedom Act uh, or of the precise timing for when there will be one. Uh, my description earlier in response to questions was not uh, a formal request for reauthorization, but rather a description of uh, some of the, from an operational perspective, what we at the FBI feel are some of the most important tools uh, currently in law that we would hate to lose. Thank you. Well, the, uh, we can follow up on that, too. You also, the Department of Homeland Security plays a critical uh, role in securing our elections, but based on your testimony from the FBI's perspe perspective, if the uh, 2020 elections were held today, are you fully confident that our uh, state and local election officials are fully prepared to defend against foreign cyber attacks. And I ask that because 22 state attorneys general asked Congress to bolster their state's election security funding, and I will put that letter in the record. Americans should feel confident in our elections, uh, in our electoral system. That does not mean that there aren't threats uh, facing it. And that doesn't mean that there isn't a lot of work, hard work, that's already being done and that needs to be done still between us, our colleagues at DHS, ODNI, NSA, state and local officials, uh, the Congress, the private sector. This is a, you know, this is a, a American issue for all of us, and we all need to work together. But Americans should feel confident that we have the finest election system in the world. Thank you. Well, we'll talk further on that. Senator Blackburn, uh, you're recognized. And thank you, sir. Uh, Mr. Ray, I want to thank you for your patience today. And as you're aware, we do have a vote series. And I appreciate that you have reached out to local law enforcement when they do have that loss of life from their force and the tribute that you pay there. And I will tell you in Tennessee, when I talk to people what they're concerned about with the FBI is that they have agents that are going to tell the truth because they know if they raise their hand and take an oath that they swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. And building, rebuilding that confidence and integrity in the system I think is of paramount importance. So I appreciate that you are putting attention on that. I do want to talk with you about the opioid crisis. The opioid crisis has really taken such a toll in Tennessee. And we know now that it is more than double the deaths from homicide. It's actually 2.4 opioid deaths for each death that is um, from a homicide. Um, and I know you've had the Appalachian Strike Force. I'd like an update on that. I know you issued uh, the 50 medical professor, professionals had an indictment issued by DOJ against them. They had uh, issued 32 million pills. Uh, and we know that you are working on the fraud issues. We had a pain clinic uh, with fraud issues. But... When I talk to local law enforcement, most of the crime they're dealing with has a nexus with the drug issue. So talk with me a little bit more about how you're managing that, the strike force, uh, how you are partnering with DEA and local law enforcement, and then the continued emphasis that you expect to have on the opioid issue. Well, thank you, Senator. I, I appreciate your flagging the issue. Uh, I know it is a top of mind for an awful lot of people in this country, as it should be. Uh, you may be interested to know that the very first of the 56 field offices I have visited was Knoxville, uh, and I've actually now made my way around to round two, so I've now been to Knoxville twice, in addition to, of course, the Memphis field office. But the reason I bring up Knoxville is that that office, in particular, for example, has done some very good work in the opioid arena. I would say that our overall, our focus on this threat 
is, is much like I said to some of your colleagues on a couple of the other threats that we face, is to try to figure out where do we, the FBI, best add value that complements what everyone else is doing, DEA, state and local law enforcement, and of course, in this arena, public health, et cetera. So what is that with the FBI? Well, one, we have, and you alluded to it, uh, we have a prescription drug initiative. So that, that's where we're going after in the healthcare arena, medical professionals, pill mills, Medicare and Medicaid fraud, nurses, pharmacies, that kind of thing, uh, because that's a big part of the problem, and that's a place where we bring unique expertise. Second, we have Safe Streets task forces all over the country, and those target gangs that are distributing the opioids uh, and fentanyl and related substances. We also have uh, something called J-Code, which is a, an initiative that's focused on disrupting and dismantling darknet marketplaces uh, for fentanyl and other opioids. We also have, uh, through our TOC, Transnational Organized Crime Program, a focus on the uh, transnational criminal organizations that are a source of the supply, Our so test. we're getting at that part. And then I guess the last piece I would mention is from a kind of an awareness raising perspective, we have done things like partner with DEA on a film called Chasing the Dragon, which we put out in schools together, um, and I think it's got a, a slew of YouTube hits, for example, and it's a way to kind of raise awareness from a prevention perspective. Okay, let me ask you, J-Code, um, I know that right now we've got 30 child pornography sites that are operating on the dark web. This is on top of what we see through a lot of, that is happening with a lot of the apps that are out there that pedophiles are using and that uh, groups are using to traffic women and children and I've had a done a good bit of work on on this issue and it is just heart-wrenching um, to me is J code and as you're looking through that and at the cartels uh, are you following the human trafficking with that initiative as well as the drug trafficking or uh, is there an additional emphasis on that human trafficking component? So it's a good question. I would say the, uh, the J-Code initiative is a darknet focused program that's more geared towards the opioid trafficking, the drug trafficking, and the related okay, crime. But we also sense? have darknet, okay. all kinds of darknet efforts that are focused more on human trafficking uh, and various other forms and of And I would assume behavior. that at some points there is a juncture because right now, the cartels are making more money on trafficking human beings than they are on make, on trafficking drugs, or that is my understanding. Um, and we definitely want to get after that. Let me ask you one more thing. Um, when it comes to the issue of illegal immigration, illegal entry, uh, NCIC is not collecting uh, re-entry data or prior deportation data on these illegal aliens. And when we talk about criminal illegal aliens, that is something that our local law enforcement has to deal with quite a bit. And uh, if NCIC were to change their uh, protocol and begin to collate and collect and collate that data, would do you think that would be helpful? Is there a value to doing that? I think I'd want to evaluate more closely some of what would be involved, but I'd be happy to take a closer look at it. Okay, that sounds great. Um, let's see, I guess I am the last one, Mr. Whitehouse. Thank you. Um, we're into a, I guess it's gonna be a very brief second round, because I'm, uh, if Senator Blackburn leaves, uh, the only one left, I've been authorized to close the hearing by Chairman Graham if nobody else comes in the uh, meantime. So, Director Ray, relief is in sight. Um, I did want to follow up a little bit. We've had a good discussion today about foreign interference in elections. Um, and I'm interested in your thoughts on the role of shell corporations that obscure the identity of the true actor behind the shell corporation, what in the jargon of this area is called the beneficial owner. 
the true beneficial owner of the corporation. Can you tell me the kind of ways in which um, the obscurity provided by such shell corporations interferes with law enforcement off efforts generally? So as a general matter, um, shell corporations, uh, dummy entities of one sort or another, uh, are often used as a way to conceal uh, the true owner of, of, of a business, and that then can have the effect of not only frustrating regulatory requirements, but also, uh, of course, law enforcement efforts. And we spend a lot of our time across a lot of the vectors that we investigate having to cut through the kind of form over substance quality that exists, uh, you know, the alter egos that essentially are created through beneficial ownership. Money laundering, fraud, criminal investigations, counterterrorism investigations, all affected by this? Uh, I can't think of a lot of counterterrorism investigations off the top of my head, but I'm sure there have been some, no. but certainly the first few you listed. And does this problem create national security concerns in addition to law enforcement concerns to the extent that foreign actors might be behind those shell corporations? Uh, they, there certainly can be times where there are national security concerns. For example, uh, one of the things that we are trying to do more now in the foreign influence space um, is more aggressively use FARA, the Foreign Agent yeah. Registration Act, in order to break through uh, not just the openly declared foreign agents, but various other entities that are created that might, in effect, be operating in that way. And we're sort of pushing into new territory there. And foreign interference in our political system can be directly facilitated by these shell corporations, correct? Absolutely. And I would flag for you that when Mr. Zuckerberg of Facebook was here, he rolled out his new and improved Facebook method for uh, detecting efforts to buy political advertising on Facebook and disclosed that he was going to go as far as the, as the nominal buyer, but not look behind the nominal buyer to see who the real party in interest was. I described this as, you know, Boris and Natasha LLC in Delaware, and suddenly, boom, that's the end of their inquiry. So I think it's important that we continue to focus on this area because some of our leading political platforms seem to be taking very little interest in finding out who is actually behind the Shell Corporation. And obviously, you need to know that if you're going to be effective. Um, the last thing that I'll ask you about is there's the famous phrase on law enforcement, follow the money. Clearly, money is a tool used for foreign influence uh, in political systems by Russia and other adversaries, correct? Yes. And if you cannot tell who the real donor is for a big political expenditure, that leaves a very obvious avenue for foreign interference to insert itself, does it not? Certainly any effort to conceal uh, the true uh, source behind an effort at foreign interference is something that we have to take seriously and um, and can present significant challenges. And money flowing into politics is a vector for that foreign interference. Uh, it can be. Yeah. Okay. That's. Thank it you for very me. much, uh, Senator Booker. Uh, we'll do his first round, then we'll go to Senator Lee, and we'll finish right at one o'clock. Uh, thank you, Director Ray, for your patience. Chairman, thank you very much. Appreciate it. Director Ray, thanks so much for being here. I'd like to go into a, a subject matter you and I have discussed before individually and, and with the Congressional Black Caucus and others, and uh, Senator Durbin, I know, brought it up. I, I watched uh, that back and forth. And you said in that conversation you don't investigate ideology, but clearly for jihadists uh, to white supremacists, the ideology as a motivating factor helps you in your investigations, correct? Certainly ideology can be a very important part of an investigation if there is all the other pieces that we have, that we have to have to be able to investigate. Yeah. And so th this is what's worrying me right now is the significance of white supremacist attacks. We've had, since 9-11, a lot of terrorist attacks, but the majority of them have been right-wing, the attacks here in the United States have 
if I'm correct, the majority of them have been right-wing extremist attacks. The majority of those have been white supremacists. Is that correct? Well, I, I want to get a little bit careful when I'm, what I'm counting and what's the numerator and denominator of what, but I, I will say that uh, certainly uh, domestic terrorism, violent extremism of all, of all shapes and sizes, uh, when it turns to violence, is something that is of great concern, that is a continuing, steady, persistent, serious threat that we're taking very seriously. And I will say that, at least over, uh, you know, some recent memory, uh, an awful lot of the uh, racially motivated violent extremism is motivated by what you might call kind of a white supremacist type of ideology. And I, and I guess that's what I want to drill down on. Um, you know, we know from a 2017 declassified joint intelligence briefing from 2000 to 2016 that white supremacist extremists were responsible for more homicides than any other domestic extremist groups, that's according to a report that was declassified. And based on your testimony, the number of arrests this year of internationally inspired homegrown extremists is roughly the same as the number of arrests for domestic violent extremists, the majority of whom, again, are white supremacist groups. And, and to me, that's a stunning data point, a stunning amount of violence that's occurring in our country motivated by white supremacy, and, and why it's all the more important that we understand the full scope of that threat. And I know you take this very seriously. And so for more than a decade, the FBI used 11 different categories to describe and document domestic terrorist threats. And these categories included a separate category for white activity, uh, white activity or uh, white supremacist activity or incidents. That's, that's correct, right? Uh, yes. Okay. And, but now the administration is using a system with only four categories. And one of those categories is called racially motivated violent extremism. That, that's correct, right? We, uh, we do have four categories, and one of them is called racially motivated violent extremism. Right. And this new category combines incidents involving white supremacists with a new uh, category that we've discussed before uh, called black identity extremists. And, and, and so that's really problematic to me. And when did, when did the FBI eliminate the white supremacist category in favor? That was just in the last number of years, right? In, in favor of that racially motivated violent extremism category. Well, let me say this. That we have tried to make clear uh, and some of it, frankly, is based on conversations that you and I had about not the white supremacist part, but about the other part. Remember, we had some very, I think, very constructive, uh, hard-hitting conversations early on about that. And I think one of the points that we've tried to emphasize to our folks across all of these vectors is that we only investigate violence. We don't investigate extremism. We don't investigate ideology. We don't investigate rhetoric. It doesn't matter how repugnant, how abhorrent, or whatever it is. It's got to be those three things that we talked about before for there to be the, uh, an investigation. And so what we have tried to do by our recategorization is make clear that it's about the violence, not about the ideology. Uh, and that's, the, that's the nature of the categorization. And, and, and if I can make this point then, this new category of black identity extremism has caused extreme concern. It's caused concern amongst the law enforcement community. And, and you know uh, that the members of the law enforcement community on, in November of 2017, the National Organization of Black Law Enforcement Executives issued a pretty strong statement that black identity extremism really is hurting the community and the ability for law enforcement. You've seen the reaction from both congressional leaders and the more. The report, uh, uh, quote unquote, resurrected the historically negative legacy of African American civil rights leaders who were unconstitutionally targeted and attacked by federal, state, and local law enforcement agencies. The investigative merits of the report do not warrant the belief that an ideology movement is, is even there um, uh, that exists among African Americans that predisposes them to negatively target law enforcement officers. And so quite specifically, how many violent attacks, if you're investigating violence, how many violent attacks and facilities have been attributed to white supremacists since 2017? Uh, and how many violent attacks and, and, and fatalities have been attributed to so-called black identity extremists since August 2017? I don't have numbers uh, of that sort here sitting in this Has there been room? any, to your knowledge, any what? attacks attributed 
to so-called black identity extremists? Has there been any since, since, uh, since 2017 whatsoever? This so-called new movement? I think we have had attacks within the racially motivated violent extremist category uh, that cover both ends of the spectrum, if you will. Um, I mean, but that language you just said, both ends of the spectrum, the murders at synagogues, murders uh, uh, that we've seen motivated since 2017 that you've uh, grievously had to deal with, you said both ends of the spectrum as if there is actually a movement of, uh, again, uh, black identity extremism. It's almost creating this reality that there is a spectrum that goes back and forth. I, I'm really questioning that language you right. used. We don't, we don't use the term black identity extremism anymore first. Second, you mentioned Noble, the National Organization of Black Law Enforcement Executives. I have met on countless occasions with them. I value that partnership. I've significantly energized it. Uh, and we have discussed with them as well some of the efforts we're making to try to uh, better characterize and categorize the work we're doing. And forgive me, this is news to me. So you, do no, you no longer use the, the, the black identity extremism. That's no more. That Correct. categorizes that's right. great. That's great news. So nobody's being surveilled or investigated on the black identity extremism. We category. don't use we don't use that terminology anymore. That was part of the reorganization of all of our domestic terrorism threat categorization. That terminology went away uh, as part of this racially motivated violent extremism category. So whatever properly predicated investigations there are or were that would be previously have cat, under that label would now be within this racially motivated violent extremism category. Okay. I look forward to continuing the conversation. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, sir. Okay. Senator Lee will take us uh, to one. And Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. A few months ago, we held a series of confirmation proceedings regarding Justice Kavanaugh. Those became contentious. They became something of a public spectacle. As was mentioned earlier, there were um, a number of allegations made. In uh, some cases, uh, then uh, committee chairman Senator Grassley uh, concluded that uh, some of the people making the accusations had knowingly made materially false uh, accusations against Justice Kavanaugh, and on that basis re referred the matter to the FBI for investigation. What, if any uh, thing, can you tell me about what action the FBI has taken on that or whether it's followed up? Um, I am aware, in, as a general matter, of, uh, of the letters or the referrals that you're describing. Uh, and I know we have reviewed them, but I'm, I'm not, uh, as I think you would expect, going to be commenting on or confirming the existence or non-existence oh, of, of an investigation. I understand. Yeah. Um, uh, I appreciate that you've, the fact that you've received it, and um, as you can imagine, it's important to the process and to this committee uh, that those appearing and testifying in front of it uh, not be allowed to knowingly make materially false statements um, uh, and, and, and hope and expect that that's going to be just fine. The reports recently indicating that the FBI uh, has been using photos from uh, various states' driver's license databases, including Utah's, uh, to conduct facial recognition searches. Uh, now, the FBI, of course, maintains a number of databases, including some data databases with photos in them. But unlike other databases containing photos that it maintains, uh, most of the photos in any state's driver's license database uh, are not going to be of people who have been convicted of crimes. Um, so let me, let me ask you, first of all, what, under what authority, what legal authority does FBI um, access and, and use these driver's license databases for criminal investigations? So uh, there are a couple things I would say on this topic. I think the, the first is when we use uh, facial recognition, I think a lot of people don't really understand this, uh, we use it for lead value, right? So there's no one who's out there who's getting arrested, much less convicted, based solely on some kind of facial recognition match, uh, you know, using the kind of database that you're describing. Uh, second, uh, I think there's a level of confusion about where these photos 
reside. We, the FBI, don't have DMV, the DMV photos in our database. We have a database of photos, but we have access. We can make requests to states for, for them to run searches in their, um, in their DMV photos, only subject to memorandums of understanding that are negotiated with those states to ensure proper compliance with the law. I think the third thing that people don't necessarily understand is that uh, we only provide access to the database to people who are properly trained on the technology. And then the last thing that people don't necessarily understand is we're working very closely with NIST, which I know you're familiar with, uh, to develop an even better algorithm, and we're on track to have an algorithm that should have over 99% accuracy uh, by the end of the calendar year, probably. So you're saying you don't take those and download them in their entirety? Correct. Uh, instead, when you're... The DMV, the DMV the photos. DMV we obviously records. have... Right. FBI generates sure. photos in, in our investigations, and we have some other databases that we get some photos from, but we don't... The DMV photos, I think there's been some confusion in some of the press coverage. It's not like all DMV photos are just available for the FBI to roam around, and we have to make requests to those states, again, only subject to the MOUs that we've negotiated with those states. And even then, it's on a case-by-case -case basis where you're conducting an investigation, there's an individual involved in that investigation, and you want to you want to match it against right. the DMV for lead, database. For lead value, for lead value. In other words, uh, that helps us then figure out whether we're on the right track. It is not uh, evidence that allows somebody to then get arrested, much less uh, convicted. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you, you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, uh, Director Ray. It's an outstanding job. Uh, tell the men and women of the FBI we appreciate their hard work and the hearings adjourned.